you ever just be sitting there and say, yeah, why not? Why not do it? Why not cover literally every single character in Borderlands' history that you can play as and cover it in one massive video? Because I sure did. I mean, I'm doing it right now. I'm literally sitting here thinking to myself, what am I supposed to do? What am I going to do? And that's what I'm thinking of. I'm going to do it. So you know what? I'm going to do it. Are you, ment are you mentally preparing yourself? Or are you mentally ready? So, you've seen a few videos from me covering literally everything by now, right? You have... You have watched them, right? You've also clicked the sub button, right? Well, this video is no different. I am once again torturing myself for a really long time for the entertainment of the people, like we're back in the good old days of the Robot Coliseum. Shout out to my boy Kai Kilius. So we're gonna do that. Sit back, relax, grab a large bag of those non-branded for legal reasons sweets you like, and let's get straight into this. This is literally every playable character in Borderlands explained. So for the sake of convenience, and also because it makes a lot of sense categorically speaking, I'm going to be splitting each game into their own separate sections. So if you want to skip to one specific game in particular, you're very welcome to do that. Like skipping straight to Borderlands 3, or skipping Borderlands 1, etc, etc. Or, you can just watch the whole thing from the beginning like a maniac. Trust me, I won't hold that against you. So we'll start off by covering Borderlands 1, which includes Brick, Mordecai, Lilith, and Roland, then moving on to Borderlands 2, which includes Axton, Zero, Maya, Salvador, Gage, and Krieg, then going on to the Paris sequel, which is Athena, Wilhelm, Nisha, Claptrap, Euralia, and Timothy, and then finally going on to Borderlands 3 with Moe's, Flack, Zane, and Amara. So what are playable characters? Borderlands includes four to six character classes, each with unique skills, abilities, and backstories. As a character gains experience and levels up, their basic statistics, such as health totals, will increase. Each class in Borderlands 1, 2, and the pre-sequel has three unique focus skill trees to develop. There is also an accessory item type specific to each class, called a class mod, that you can equip. Borderlands 3 expanded on the skill tree formula by adding an additional skill tree to the mix, this is also the reason why there is only four Vault Hunters in 3 as opposed to the two previous games. RIP my hopes and dreams. Each character is made to bend to the will of us, the player, as we make them do absolutely heinous crimes like picking up TDO gun. And just in case you think I'm some rookie to this shite, I'm being dead serious when I say I'm covering literally everything. Like, you may be thinking, Oh, he's just gonna say Gage can only use an Anarchy build and she has a cover. No, I'm covering everything. From the skills, what they do, the backstories of the characters, motivations, behind the scenes, pros of the characters, gameplay-wise, what makes them good, what makes them bad, good builds to use, what weapons they like, sexual orientation, mother's maiden name, social security, no, no more waiting. Let's jump straight in with the first ever Vault Hunters we set our eyes on. The Borderlands 1 Fuckerinos. Borderlands 1 introduces players to their first ever taste of what a Borderlands character actually is, each with their own unique personalities and motivations. Many people think the Gearbox hit the nail on the head with these lot, because they have been involved with every single other Borderlands game moving forward in one way or the other, even if it is just time to talk to Lilith every four fucking minutes. Vault Hunter, come up to Sanctuary. Talk to Lilith. Time to talk to Lilith. They are clearly fan favourites and very much loved within the franchise. Roland, the soldier, stands as a disciplined leader with a sense of duty, while Lilith, the siren, embodies a mix of rebelliousness and mystical power. Mordecai, the hunter, displays a calm demeanour masking deadly precision, thanks to his pet bird Bloodwing. Lastly, Brick. Need I say more? Consumes gravel with honey for breakfast, eats hundreds of grams of protein on a daily basis, and would punch all of his problems away if that was even physically possible. As Vault Hunters on the desolate planet of Pandora, these characters come together to pursue the mythical Vault, leading an engaging blend of death, dust, wacky alien shit, and of course, loot baby baby! So, we're going to be starting off with Mordecai. Oh God. Mordecai is Borderlands' hunter class. He relies on damage dealt with precise marksmanship and the use of falconry to defeat enemies and acquire loot. He returns in Borderlands 2 and Borderlands 3 as a supporting character. Background Mordecai is originally from Artemis, and at the age of 17, Mordecai won an interplanetary sharpshooting competition with a revolver. The other competitors, all of whom were using sniper rifles, accused him of cheating and eventually got him banned from the competition for unsportsmanlike conduct. Although many witnesses noted he did not display any unsportsmanlike behaviour until after the accusations began. 
He now travels from planet to planet with his trusty companion Bloodwing, searching for everything this freaking universe owes me, which Mordecai has defined as a better gun and unlimited cash. Every American's dream, eh? It is also revealed in one of his voice lines in Borderlands 3 that he has an older sibling, although not much is known about them. Involvement Mordecai, along with Roland, Brick and Lilith, was a founding member of the Crimson Raiders. Between the events of Borderlands and Borderlands 2, Mordecai was involved with Moxie, whom he won as a prize from the Underdome. Their relationship went sour, and Moxie left him for Handsome Jack, who was just known as Jack at the time. He also becomes an alcoholic, and drinks even before fighting. When Hyperion attacked New Haven, Mordecai fought Wilhelm along with Lilith and Roland, but they were easily defeated. In Borderlands 2, he learns of a Hyperion train convoy moving through the Tundra Express, supposedly carrying the Vault Key. Roland tells the Vault Hunters to meet him there, and he assists them by providing sniper fire, the most useless sniper covering fire I've ever had in a single video game, but, you know, you like that? After Sanctuary's relocation, he heads to the Wildlife Exploitation Preserve to obtain a Claptrap software upgrade to bypass the deterrence field leading to the bunker. Mordecai was overrun by Hyperion troops and escaped after Bloodwing distracted them, but was taken to one of the facility's pens. The Vault Hunters managed to find her, but mutated after being subject to slag experimentation. They managed to weaken Bloodwing and retrieve the Claptrap upgrades, but Jack detonates her collar, killing her and sending Mordecai into a rage. After helping the Vault Hunter to escape the outer perimeter of the Wildlife Exploitation Preserve, Mordecai returns to Sanctuary. Mordecai and Brick assume command of the Crimson Raiders after the loss of Roland and Lilith. When the Vault Hunters obtain the information on the Vault of the Warriors location, he and Brick assist them in the first gauntlet of Hero's Path with a captured Hyperion drop barge until it is targeted by a moon blitz. You get the hell away from my friend! Oh god, is he screaming again? I don't care how many times I hear that, I will laugh literally 100% of the time. Against Mordecai's insistence, Brick jumps back onto the barge, which is then struck by the blitz, sending them both crashing into the lava. Both of them manage to survive and make it out to the vault after Jack and the Warriors defeat and witness the activation of the map showing the locations of many other vaults scattered throughout the universe. The sketches in the credits show Mordecai holding a Bloodwing hatchling. In Sir Hamelock vs the Son of Cromrex DLC, it is revealed that he named the hatchling Talon and quit drinking to raise him. In episode 3 of Tales from the Borderlands, Mordecai and Brick are hired by the gang Lord Valerie to apprehend Athena, whom they learned was once allied with Handsome Jack. The two of them dueled with Athena and Fiona, and was almost defeated had Valerie not interfered. After knocking Athena out with a rocket launcher, Valerie allowed the two Vault Hunters to take Athena back to Sanctuary. In Borderlands the pre-sequel, Mordecai is seen in the introduction scene with Brick limping away, after Lilith noted how it took the two to capture Athena. He is seen again in the final scene along with Brick, objecting to Lilith's order to execute Athena. Despite the objections, Lilith still orders the Crimson Raiders soldiers to carry out the executions anyway, only to have the bullets stopped by the Watcher, who warns them that war is imminent and they need to start recruiting Vault Hunters. <coughs> Just doesn't happen. <coughs> Gearbox issue. In Borderlands 3, during the mission Hammerlocked, Brick, Mordecai, Tiny Tina and the Vault Hunter are hired by Wainwright Jacobs to rescue Sir Hammerlock, where he resumes his role of providing cover at range. Mordecai's call sign during this mission is <coughs> Birdman. Skills. Mordecai has Bloodwing as a pet, a predatory avian that can be unleashed upon enemies to damage, kill them, or bake them a pie. Only kidding, she can't cook for shit. Bloodwing can be commanded to attack enemies and can be upgraded for increased damage and speed at higher levels. She will attack any target bracketed in the crosshairs when she launches. If Bloodwing is blind fired, she will seek out the nearest target in the general direction Mordecai was facing in. Her attack range is limited, however, and more suitable to close combat conditions than for supporting long range sniping. Bloodwing can be called back before the full duration of her flight expires. If she was called back before she attacked an enemy, she can be reused immediately. Kinda like a condom that's still warm. Otherwise, her cooldown time will commence when the bird returns after a target has been struck. Bloodwing will never attack at the same target twice in a row, however. A useful tactic when using the Bird of Prey skill is when there are two enemies remaining. Bloodwing will constantly alternate between the two targets until she's reached her target limit. This is especially useful when Crimson Lance Engineers send out their Scorpio turret, which technically qualifies as an enemy. See, Bloodwing predicted Terminator 2 before Terminator 2 predicted Terminator 2. Give this bird a raise. Another pro of Bloodwing is that she's a little cutie pie and will distract the enemies by just being the cutest little thing. <laughs> she's also underrated as a character. I hope she... blows up soon? Okay, I'll leave. Strategy. 
Mordecai's playstyle is that of a sharpshooter. He is well suited for ranged combat, being able to have improved accuracy in dealing the most damage with well placed critical hits. Based on how his skill points are distributed, he is also able to do high damage with other guns, though most of his skills lead to a preference of sniper rifles and pistols. His melee weapon is a sword, which can also be a tool of great harm. All these advantages come at the expense of his own durability under fire, making him essentially a glass cannon. His three skill trees are Sniper, which increases skills with sniper rifles as well as group experience bonuses and accuracy, Rogue, which mainly focuses on increasing the potency of his Bloodwing as well as gaining loot, and finally Gunslinger, which improves his usage of pistols as well as his melee weapon. Play Mordecai involves making extra use of shields and evasive manoeuvres, more than any of the other classes. Fighting in close quarters and boss battles can be difficult, while many fights in open areas will be a lot easier. Whoa, what the fuck? Fuck off! Fuck! Fuck off! It's time to bring it back, I know you've all been waiting for it, it's fun fact time! Mordecai's character model prior to the game release was much more beefier looking when compared to the final design. Reaver from Borderlands 1 uses this older character model in the final release of Borderlands. According to his profile, Mordecai is colourblind and dislikes eating. I can't tell by his frame. He's also stated to be 39 years old, though it is unknown if this is before or after the skip to Borderlands 2. In the secret armoury of the depressed man-child soldier, oh wait, no, sorry, the secret armoury of General Knox, his wanted poster states his bounty is $1 million for poaching hand possession of an endangered species. And in red handwritten text at the bottom, it says, another million for that annoying bird. This makes his bounty the second highest, assuming Bloodwing is killed, of the original Vault Hunters, being beaten out by Brick. Though this is later changed in Borderlands 2 to be 6 billion for the bird and 20 bucks for the has-been. Either inflation is a bitch on Pandora or Jack really wants that bird. Like, I don't. Mordecai is compared to a truckskin wrestler at the start of Borderlands when Marcus says, You with the sniper rifle and the crazy mask. <laughs> You look like a Truxican wrestler. Moonlighting is a dominatrix, man. Truxican wrestler appears to be a play on the word Mexican wrestler, as Mexican wrestlers wear matching masks and suits, not too dissimilar to Mordecai's. The name also appears on a melee-oriented class mod. General Knox makes a comment on Mordecai on his Twitter account, Troops will deploy today if all goes to plan. Just met a man named Mordecai. Dude, eat something. Referencing Mordecai's rather thin build. You don't say. He's built like a pe he's actually built like a pencil. Mordecai's main sniper rifle in Borderlands 2 is a Slag Malawan Corinthian with all Jacob's parts and the critical bipod accessory. In the game's files, the rarity for his rifle is named GD underscore weep underscore sniper rifles dot A underscore weapons dot sniper underscore Malawan underscore four underscore Mordecai. His weapon is separate from a normal Corinthian and cannot be obtained even with the use of a save editor. Mmm, fun facts for you guys, moving on. Though not my personal favourite in the first Borderlands, I can see why a lot of people would like Mordecai. The cheeky, sometimes drunk, lovable Truxican with an innate love for his pet Bloodwing is a bond you can't help but admire. The only real thing that I wish for Mordecai is to have a lot more substantial role in the next game. Being relegated to the B team and one story mission in Borderlands 3 will forever annoy me and anyone else who has grown up with this guy. Having at least a pivotal role in the story must be important. Whilst Moxie left you, Roland died on you and Gearbox forgot about you, we as players will never forget you Mordecai. Next, we're going to be moving on to the sexy, red-haired, kinda obsessive and needy, Book crack showing, maybe kinda dead, but also not dead at the same time, phase walking badass, Lilith. So. Lilith is Borderlands' siren class. She is originally from the planet Dionysus and is one of six sirens, a group of women with unbelievable powers. She is one of the four playable characters in the original Borderlands, a major character in Borderlands 2 and Borderlands the pre-sequel, and the deuterogonist of Borderlands 3. Background. There isn't actually much known about the backstory of Lilith, being one of the least explored characters in the series up to this point, which I find kind of ironic considering the current <clears throat> situation. So the only sources we actually have available are the Borderlands Origin comic book issue 2 involving her and a few others, and the actual physical manual for the first Borderlands game. Listen up buckaroos. This is an extract taken from the comic. As Lilith waits for the bus, she reminisces about the past, and how people constantly refer to her as special due to her being a siren. Years before, on the planet Honus 4651, Lilith's father expires in front of her, begging her to go and see the universe, 
or she would find him among the stars. The eldest approaches her shortly afterwards, telling her that her father belongs to the mealworms and that Lilith is a siren, mentioning that she would find others in the galaxy, some who would be her enemies or her allies. The eldest tells Lilith to sing her song and live her story, before collapsing in front of her, presumably dying. Years later on Pandora, Lilith, now grown up, sits in a bar drinking. The bartender makes conversation with her, asking why she is drinking so heavily. She goes into a rant about all the names people call her, ranging from baby to sugar bugger, before stating that her name is Lilith. The bartender recognises the name and pulls a gun on her, joined by another man in the bar who corners her from behind. Lilith shows no concern for the weapons, phase shifting just as they fire so that they kill each other. The door to the bar opens afterwards, and Lilith picks up one of the weapons, only to reveal that Marcus has arrived. Lilith asks him if he is the bus driver, and he tells her who he is, as well as an arms dealer. She chastises him for it, but he simply replies, Bandora is what you make of it. He then asks if she wants to hear a story, to which she replies that she does. Back in present day, Lilith thinks on how things brought her here, on being a siren and ending up on a bus that smells like boiled feet. While Marcus objects, Roland agrees with Lilith before she kisses him abruptly. He asks why, and she replies that she's seen some of the galaxy but never kissed a boy. He attempts to reassure her by saying that neither is he, and that they both agree for some awkward silence. Next up is the most mad place you would think you would find the majority of the lore about Lilith, the bloody user's manual. Once again, shut the fuck up and listen to your boy here. So far, only 13 people have publicly demonstrated so-called magical abilities, all of whom are women. Due to the gender bias, these gifted individuals are often called witches or sirens, although no official term exists. Studying the cause of these women's powers are proven difficult, as they are always prone to wanderlust and have little patience for extending scientific probing. Lilith claims her powers come from her crossing the hotness threshold. Any woman as good looking as me can do what I do, is her official statement for such an inquiry. So yeah, that's the limited backstory that's available for Lilith. It's not as cutthroat and as dry as others. It is very mixed and there are a lot of talking about certain specific events that you haven't really heard of before or talking about a generalized term like Sirens, not specifically Lilith. But it does show that she's come from a planet, that she's been told to go explore the universe and that some people like her, some people really dislike her and that she is a wanted Siren at the beginning of the Borderlands game. Involvement. Lilith plays a noticeable role as an NPC in Borderlands the pre-sequel. After the opening of the vault and the defeat of General Baby Child Robot, which I'm sorry, the General Knox, Lilith and Roland travel to Pandora's moon Elpis on a vacation trip, which was where they met Jack for the first time, who asked them for help against Colonel Zarpadon, aka Mrs. Tongue Teen Zarpaderp, aka bitch that never dropped anything useful after your game ended at like 17 times. They didn't want to go near the situation with a 10 foot stick at first, but they ended up helping when they realised the true danger behind the attacks. So, they cooperated with Jack and the Vault Hunters to recover the Helios Station and its main weapon, a giant laser. They were all hunky-dory until they saw how Jack killed three scientists by throwing them into fucking space at the goddamn airlock. <coughs> Reasonable reason to get the fuck out, not gonna lie. Lilith didn't want to continue helping him, but Roland kept acting normally and then made a plan in order to defeat Zarpadon while also preventing Jack from using the laser. They kept helping, but with Mad Moxie's help, in the end, they destroyed the laser and almost the entire Helios station. Later, Jack found the vault he was looking for on Elpis and obtained an Iridian relic that granted him some visions of the warrior's existence. But Lilith, who had been following him, appeared and destroyed the relic, creating a blast of energies that branded Jack's face with the vault emblem and having one of the most badass and face-melting one-liners of our time. Hey, a handsome. Sometime later, the Crimson Raiders captured Athena, a former Lance Assassin turned Vault Hunter who was among the people that helped Handsome Jack rise to power during the events on Elpis. Originally, she was a deserter. I initially read that as deserter, like, you know, like, dessert. I should probably go get something to eat. Originally, she was a deserter from the Crimson Lance and was rescued and helped by Lilith and others during the secret armory of Big General Knox DLC. Knowing that, and threatening her with a firing squad, Lilith demanded that Athena explain why she did what she did. Athena recounts the events of Borderlands, the pre-sequel, leading up to Jack's takeover and argues that the Jack she knew then was nothing like the one that nearly destroyed Pandora. But Lilith says, fuck all that, blames Athena for everything that happened and orders her execution anyway. <laughs> the arrival of a mysterious alien, the Watcher, saves Athena and warns Lilith that war is coming and that she'll need every Vault Hunter she can get. 
Once again, <coughs> never ended up happening. <coughs> Gearbox. <laughs> Lilith and Roland returned to Pandora as Hyperion began its rise. Lilith's power screwed substantially from absorbing Iridium, the element released after the defeat of the Destroyer. She was one of the founding members of the Crimson Raiders to fight against Hyperion, along with Brick, Mordecai, and her then boyfriend, Roland. During Hyperion's raid on New Haven, she, along with Roland, Mordecai, and Brick, were defeated. With the city overrun and she presumed dead by Hyperion, they were forced to abandon New Haven for Sanctuary. Roland ended his relationship with Lilith in order to focus on Hyperion and the Crimson Raiders, while she drew Bloodshot Bandits away from Sanctuary under the alias of the Firehawk. This is the era of Lilith I like to coin the needy bitch who will hit you up at 3am with a DTF question mark text and then eat ice cream while crying because you didn't message back after three fucking se Seriously, look at Roland's Echo Net page in Frostburn Canyon. Like, damn, Shoddy. He'll text you back, just like give him five minutes. After Roland was captured by the Bloodshots, she sent a message under her Firehawk alias telling the Vault Hunters to come to Frostburn Canyon. This is the Firehawk. Come to Frostburn Canyon or people will die. When they reached her base of operations, they discovered that Roland wasn't there and Lilith was actually the Firehawk. After fighting off waves of Psycho with the power of her new, fancy and super fucking annoying Phase Blast ability, Lilith returned to Sanctuary to lead the Crimson Raiders in Roland's absence. But not before snowing a big old line that red rock, you know what I'm saying? I need a pick-me-up. When Sanctuary became unshielded after Angel's treason, Lilith became LA's biggest junkie, but by like 10 times more, by doping herself full of the purple stuff. She was able to make the whole city enter Phase Walk with her. Sanctuary became the current flying city, safe from Hyperion. However, she had at that point revealed that she was alive and working with the Crimson Raiders. And also, once again, blessed us with the most in your face city teleporting one liner you can get. Sup. Later, Lilith was told to stay and defend Sanctuary during the assault on Control Core Angel, but defied both Angel's insistence and Roland's orders to stay away and came anyway like an absolute chad. How you doing? She assisted the Vault Hunters in fighting off hordes of Hyperion robots, and phase walked Roland to reach the shield generators, allowing the Vault Hunters to destroy Angel's Iridium injectors. With Jack's Siren Catalyst dead, Roland went to retrieve the Vault Key, but was shot from behind by Jack himself. Lilith attempted to attack him, but was restrained by Jack. Kinky. And had some kind of artifact attached to her that allowed Jack to drain her of her powers. Shut up. Horny jail. Now. She would replace his dead daughter to charge the Vault Key. She teleported the Vault Hunters back to Sanctuary instead of killing them at Jack's orders. She was then taken to the Vault of the Warrior, where she became the catalyst to charge the Vault Key against her will while undergoing torture from Jack. The Vault Hunters found her there, along with Jack, who fought them. But while fighting, the key became fully charged. So, even defeated, Jack summoned and controlled the Warrior. The warrior made like some vintage gouda in 40 degree heat and melted in a disappointing but kind of satisfying way. With his own vision of Pandora ruled by order crushed, Jack cried like a little bitch for about a minute until Lilith shut him the fuck up. No, 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 I can't. I like this. Not when I'm so close. And not at the hands of a psychopath! psychopath! I could have saved You're this planet. a savage! You're... A is practically a god. How in the hell have you killed my war? Man, shut your bitch ass up, nigga. After Jack's death, she intended to destroy the vault key to prevent anyone else from using it for misdeeds. But instead, she inadvertently activated a map showing the location of many other vaults scattered throughout the galaxy. Following the events at the vault, she returned to Sanctuary along with Mordecai, Brick, and the Vault Hunters, inheriting leadership of the Crimson Raiders and continuing their fight against Hyperion. She later attended Roland's burial along with Mordecai, Brick, and Tina. With Hyperion later defeated, Lilith and the rest of the Raiders set their sights beyond the stars, as Marcus puts it. But they had massive problems on their hands. Tannis became pissed off, as she usually does when something normal that requires human emotion to understand happens. She hadn't understood why they hadn't explored any of the locations on the vault map yet. Ellie then explained that Sanctuary is in dire straits and needed some sort of replacement or upgrade before things could even get close to becoming spacebound. With tensions rising as talk of disbanding the Raiders took place, Mordecai exclaimed that something needed to get done and the Raiders needed a leader, and including Lilith being hesitant about leading, things looked ropey. After the defeat of Hector and the fate that almost occurred to Sanctuary and all of the Crimson Raiders at the beginning, Lilith finally decided to step up and be the leader that people needed her to be, and the one she knew she could be. And everyone lived happily ever after and went out for milkshakes and of course that's not all. With Hector dying, the fate of Sanctuary and the Vault Key was sealed 
They were both destroyed due to Hector being bonded with them. And if Lilith killed him, she killed them. As far as they were both concerned anyway. Nope. Apparently, the vault key is just hidden in the middle of the fucking planet somewhere, just bing chilling and taking a long needed break from all the Gearbox's shit. For now, anyway. In the opening mission of Borderlands 3, Lilith is looking for new Crimson Raider recruits who are willing to investigate the children of the Vault Cult. She gives the mission to the Vault Hunters to find more information about the new vaults popping up around the galaxy, because she can't do it herself. Tyrene then leached her ability to use her siren powers, and as head as the Crimson Raiders, she could command the tiny army that they had to investigate certain areas. When Tyrene is ultimately defeated, Lilith gains her siren powers back and risks herself to save both Pandora and Elpis. It is currently unknown if Lilith is alive or dead. Skills Lilith's action skill is called Phase Walk, which lets her turn invisible to enemies. This allows her to move much faster and cause a damaging shockwave or a phase blast upon entering and exiting. When fighting in arena battles, Phase Walk will make Lilith invisible to opposing players, but all sirens in Phase Walk can see each other regardless of teams, as they are all in the same dimension. Spark does not work in arena either, however, it does function in duels. This effect can be altered by using unique artifacts that can add elemental damage to the Phase Blast. Not my favourite skill of all time, I feel like later on with Zero it was established a lot better, and um, yeah, Phase Lock's a lot better, uh, fight me. Strategy Lilith typically operates as a close range striker, using numerous elemental damage enhancements to inflict damage and a range of self buffing skills to quickly enter and exit the fray, as well as to survive once in the heat of battle. Her active ability Phase Walk allows her to either sneak in or out of hostile groups with a cover of invisibility and increased speed. And she's capable of dealing high damage with melee attack combined with Phase Walk or with ranged attacks. She can especially excel with elemental weapons and is capable of dazing the opponent she hits. While not exactly durable, Lilith can use her phase walk defensively to aid her survival. She has a class mod that enhances SMGs, and with the secret armor of General Nox, one that enhances sniper rifles as well. Otherwise, she can pretty much use any weapons type, with some advantages from the skill tree for high damage critical hit weapons like snipers, and slow projectile weapons like the Iridian Cannon. The skill trees are Assassin, which gives her more damage in melee slash ranged combat and on critical hits, Controller, which gives her the ability to daze targets she attacks and boosts her shields, and Elemental, which adds bonuses for weapons that employ explosive, static, incendiary and corrosive damage. Spread throughout the three trees are some defensive abilities to increase her resilience and elusiveness. Everyone's favourite section of the show now? It is fun fact time. Lilith's melee attack is an energy blast. In T-Bone Junction, there's a secret shrine devoted to Lilith. Yes, simps existed, even back in the day, and even in Pandora. And why are they all, why are they all got weird red, blue, green hair as well? Like it consists of her wanted poster and two spinning circles over her breasts. Suave. It can be accessed by pressing a button by the red chest underneath the town, then walking around the building and opening the door. Lilith is seen using her phase walk ability on the bus in the intro, but she must level up to level 5 to use it in the game, so she's basically just cheating. Lilith's wanted poster focuses on her chest and doesn't show most of her face above her mouth. Sexist mother Lilith is a name with origins in Judeo-Christian mythology spanning thousands of years. The name has been associated with demonic and elemental entities, often portrayed as seductress redhead women. Once again, why, what is it with redheads, man? According to unused texture profiles, Lilith's full name and title is Dr. Lilith Cashlin, mercenary scientist. Lilith was originally depicted as a white-haired, very pale-skinned woman with yellow pupils and a slightly alien appearance to her. This design has since been used for, as you can probably guess, Commandant Steel, although Lilith's final design retains the yellow eyes. At the Firehawk layer in Frostburn Canyon, one of Lilith's computer screens displays the infamous BSOD, or Blue Screen of Death, triggered by fatal errors in Windows operating systems. It also shows a humorous message that reads, So, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but your system is pretty host. Maybe if you damn load less of that illegal trucks can pour in, your machine wouldn't be all jacked up. You should probably be embarrassed. Too much underscore pran underscore wxyz dot sys. If this is the first time you're seeing this, then that means nobody has caught you yet. Tell you what's going to happen here. You're going to put a new graphics card in me and strip that gunk off the keyboard, and then maybe a search history won't be mailed to your grandma. You picking up what I'm laying down? Okay. <laughs> what? What?
Lilith admits during an argument with Mr. Torg during Bunkers and Badasses that as a kid she was made fun of for her tattoos and playing Bunkers and Badasses, and repeatedly references herself as a geek. Hope you guys like the fun facts, because I've got oh, I've got a lot more of them coming your way very, very soon. But that was uh, that was Lilith covered all in one massive long, really long, really long story. I love Lilith as a character. Lilith is special. She's someone who has appeared in all of the Borderlands games and has played a very instrumental part in the story. A fan favourite for sure, and someone whose future is, at least at the moment of this video, uncertain. While I feel like the siren aspect of her character gameplay-wise was done in a better way, she was the OG of sirens, and the first taste that anyone had of this mystical, vault-driven, glowing, tattoo-having badass. She gave great fundamentals moving forward, and was the building block for how a siren should be. Wherever you are, Lilith, I wish you good luck. Now, we're going to move on to Axton's crush's dad, the man allergic to smiling, the man being played by Kevin Hart. Please don't ruin his character, please, please, please. Tiny Tina, who is it? It's Roland! Roland is Borderlands' soldier class. He is originally from the planet Promethea and is a former soldier of the Crimson Lance the highly trained private military of the Atlas Corporation. He is proficient with all weapons, although he prefers shotguns and combat rifles. Roland's main backup is a deployable Atlas Scorpio turret that can be tossed about at any time he deems worthy. Background Atlas records state that Roland was honourably discharged from the Crimson Lance. Unfortunately, Crimson Lance doctrine states that the only type of discharge is dishonourable, which generally involves a bullet through the skull. When questioned about it, either his involvement in or departure from the Crimson Lance, Roland quickly changes the subject to loot, of which he firmly believes there is always room for more. He chooses to wear pieces of the old Crimson Lance uniform as sort of a fuck you to the corporation, and it does kind of look sexy. Involvement After the opening of the vault and the defeat of General Knox, Lilith and Roland travel to Pandora's Moon Elpis on a vacation trip. There was where they met Jack for the first time, who asked them for help against Colonel Zarpadon through the Vault Hunters. They didn't want to have anything to do with that at first, but Roland ended up helping when he realised the true danger behind the attacks. Both Roland and Lilith cooperated with Jack and the Vault Hunters to recover the Helios Station and its main weapon. Unfortunately, Jack had a dark side. Roland saw through this and decided to keep helping, but eventually betrayed him. You heard all of this from the Lilith backstory, so... Following the Vault Hunter's defeat of General Knox, the Atlas Corporation abandoned all remaining Crimson Lance soldiers on Pandora. Roland used this opportunity to rally the Lancemen against Hyperion, pledging to give them a cause for their previous employer could not promise them. Forming the Crimson Raiders, along with Mordecai Brick and his then girlfriend Lilith, they took the fight to Hyperion and throughout the events of Borderlands 2. The Raiders were originally stationed in New Haven, but was discovered when Shep Sanders disclosed its location to Hyperion. Overrun by the company, and with Lilith believed dead by Hyperion, the Raiders relocated to Sanctuary. Roland then ended his relationship with Lilith to focus on defending the town while she drew away the bandits. Roland was captured by the Bloodshots, a bandit group who attempted to claim the bounty on his head. With the assistance of Lilith, the Vault Hunters rescued him from Hyperion. Oh. He then resumes his post as a leader of the Crimson Raiders and assigns story quests to the Vault Hunters. Damn boy, he th In the Crimson Raider slash slab joint strike on Control Core Angel, he assists the Vault Hunters in retrieving the Vault Key. In the core of the facility, he lowers the shields guarding Angel's Iridium injectors while the Vault Hunters destroy them. The shields down, shoot the injectors now! Yes, I am aware of that, Roland, but unfortunately, I am being pegged by an angelic guard robot who is five levels above me for some reason. I should have farmed Fink Slaughterhouse. Against Roland and Angel's insistence, Lilith appears as well. When Angel dies, Roland goes to retrieve the vault key, but is shot dead by Handsome Jack. After Jack is defeated, Roland is buried with the original Vault Hunters tearfully mourning him. A manifestation of Roland becomes part of the plot for Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon's Keep, where he is added in random points at wherever Tiny Tina wants to. EMOTIONAL TRAUMA DUMPING MUCH! Ultimately representing how Tina can't let go of Roland after his death. He acts the same AI-wise, deploying his Scorpio turret and assisting the player, using only that shitty Jacob's White Rarity rifle, like bros in a fucking fantasy world with dragons and shotguns that have exploding swords and the best he could get was something you'd find in the southern shelf toilet at level 6. Roland, in said game, identifies himself as a white knight of the Queen. After the original Vault Hunters finish their game, they gather at Roland's memorial statue, joined by Claptrap and the new Vault Hunters, where Tina says her farewell. <laughs> maybe, maybe tear up a bit, I'm not gonna lie. Skills 
Roland's action skill is a sentry gun called the Scorpio turret. A turret that shoots enemies and also provides a shield for cover. Sorry for all Roland lovers out there, but it's basically just a shit version of Axton's Dahl Saber turret. Dahl over Atlas, woo! Roland's turret will be affected in one of three ways depending on which skill tree the player decides to fully upgrade. The turret lasts 20 seconds, and the turret is very versatile ability, when used correctly. It can fill a wide range of solutions, such as being used to cover the player's side to keep them from being flanked, or temporarily holding off enemies while the player retreats. The Scorpio turret is also the longest skill to cool down out of all the original four Vault Hunters, mainly due to its <coughs> devastating capabilities. Investments in the infantry branch of the skill tree can increase the Scorpio turret's damage, reduce its cooldown time, and even allow it to shoot guided missiles. Still not as good as the Dahl Saber turret though. Dahl, baby! Investments in the support branch of the skill tree can reduce the Scorpio turret's cooldown, increase its burst fire count, and allow it to eject resupply packs to replenish the ammunition and grenade stocks of all team members. Investments in the medic branch of the skill tree can add team regeneration or revive effects to the turret. Strategy some of Roland's abilities are meant to supplement and support the party, while some boost his offensive capabilities. He is by far the best support class because his turret can be upgraded to heal and regenerate ammunition for him and his allies. He's the only character that cannot boost his melee in some way, but his upgrades for the Scorpio turret are more spread amongst his skill trees. This makes it potentially more useful in more situations than the other character's action skills, except Lilith whose skills are spread out the same amount. Isn't that convenient? Roland is also the only playable character who does not have an action skill to daze enemies and has the only action skill capable of being taken out by weapons fire apart from character death. Okay, so maybe I was a bit harsh on the old Scorpio. The health floaty things have saved me more than a few times in both Borderlands 1 and 2, so I can at least give it that. But still, doll supremacy, bit. Okay, now it's time for my favorite part of the show. Once again, it's funnest of the factoid times. I, should, I need to get like a theme tune or something for that. Early concept art of Roland depicted him as a light-skinned male with dark and graying hair. Though his design has since been changed, these early concepts show a very strong resemblance to Dr. Z meaning that it is possible that these early designs were recycled and used for the Doctor. Imagine a playable Doctor said that'd be fun. In the opening where the Vault Hunters are seen as children, Roland's attire is a simpler version of his Crimson Lance armor he wears as an adult. His pauldron is a trash can lid, his grenadier cap is replaced with a boonie hat, he wears the same scarf, and his grievous fashioned out of what appears to be a piece of sheet metal. It is stated in Roland's profile that he dislikes publicity. Ironically, despite this, he appears to be okay with having his picture on dozens of recruitment posters across Sanctuary. The sacrifices this man makes, oh my god, he is perfect. Roland appears to be the leader of the original Vault Hunters as they take orders from him after rejoining the Crimson Raiders without protest. This is also suggested by one of his class mods in Borderlands being the leader. In Borderlands 2, due to his rank and the severity of circumstances, Roland seems to have difficulty expressing himself, as Lilith has to tell the player what he means to say when he speaks sometimes. Handsome Jack is gonna kill us all unless you can stop him. He means hi. That's his way of saying hi. Right. Sorry. Handsome Jack is gonna kill us all. As I said, and as Jack also said, he is allergic to fucking smiling, I swear to god. In Borderlands 2 on one of Lilith's monitors in the Firehawk's lair, as well as the Crimson Raid HQ, an online profile for Roland states that he was homeschooled in 2854. Damn. This is only visible with the PC PhysX graphics on high though. You console nerds, can't see that shit. And the final fun factorino. What am I, Flanders? It's probably quite noticeable if you've played the first game, but Roland actually changed voice actors between Borderlands 1 and 2, being voiced by Oliver Tull in Borderlands 1 and Marcus Lloyd in Borderlands 2 and the pre-sequel. So that was Roland, the mass murdering leader of the Crimson Raiders. Only joking. Well, kinda. He is a mass murderer. Have you seen the footage from his time in the first game? <laughs> Unless Lil Gas Mask 666 did a pacifist run on Borderlands 1 anyway. One of the most iconic characters in the entire franchise, he deserved more time to shine in my opinion. And though he never smiled much, I'm sure it makes us smile knowing that he didn't have to be around in Borderlands 3 for them just to fucking ruin his character. Rest easy boss. And lastly for the Borderlands 1 lot, we're talking about the man, the myth, the meat machine, the dude who would probably unironically consume a newly born child because big protein, small meal, hunk of absolute chad, it's Brick. Hell yeah! 
Brick is the playable Berserker class character in Borderlands and is an NPC in Borderlands 2, Borderlands the pre-sequel, Tales from the Borderlands, Borderlands 3 and Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, which, fun fact, coming in early this time boys, never know when they're going to hit you, makes him the second most frequent character in all of Borderlands media, beating out Handsome Jack, Lilith and even Marcus. He is only beaten out by, of course, Claptrap. As the Berserker, he is able to effectively use explosive weaponry and powerful melee attacks to decimate his foes, as well as endure more overall punishment from enemy attacks. Background The Borderlands manual states, The source of Brick's size and strength is baffling considering his mother and father are born slightly under 5 feet tall. Depending on the day, he attributes his physique to either his daily vitamin consumption or the lucky paw of his beloved dog Priscilla that he wears around his neck. Regardless of the cause of his strength, he continues to bring his fists to a gunfight and still manages to come out on top. Brick is originally from the planet Menoetius, and is one of the four original Vault Hunters who sought to uncover the vault hidden on Pandora. In addition, Brick is one of the founding members of the Crimson Raiders. However, Roland had expelled Brick from their base of Sanctuary after his brutal killing of Shep Sanders, who had disclosed New Haven's location to Hyperion, which led to its destruction by Handsome Jack's forces. Later on, Brick decided to become a bandit after Hyperion began treating him as such. He then formed the Slab Gang, with himself as the leader. Brick became known to most of Pandora as the Slab King. Personally, I want to know where the fuck the Slab Queen, Slab Prince and Slab Princess is, but, alas, involvement. After gaining the Claptrap upgrades, Roland tells the Vault Hunters to go to Thousand Cuts to gain the Slab King's assistance. When Brick's bandits reveal the Vault Hunters aren't from Hyperion, he just decides, oh yeah, they must be here to join my gang then, obviously. Why the fuck else would someone come storming in and killing literally everything within a 10 meter radius of them without a shred of mercy? After murdering like 70% of his entire workforce, he welcomes them into the gang and agrees to assist them with the Hyperion Bunker. At that moment, Brick's territory is attacked by Hyperion forces, and Brick fights with the Vault Hunters to repel the attack in probably the most annoying ass mission this side of Pandora. Come on, come on, yes, 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 okay, okay, come on. Oh, yes! Yes! Afterwards, he returns to Sanctuary, where he will then give out side missions. During the assault on the new Vault Hyperion discovered, Mordecai commands a captured barge carrying Brick. Both of them help the Vault Hunters through the first gauntlet of Hera's path, until the barge is targeted by a moon blitz. Brick jumps back into the barge, which is then struck by the blitz and crashes into the lava. However, the two survive the crash and make it to the vault, and witness the activation of the map showing the locations of the many other vaults scattered throughout the galaxy. Nips. In episode 3 of Tales from the Borderlands, Mordecai and Brick are hired by the gang Lord Valerie to apprehend Athena, whom they learned was once allied with Handsome Jack. The two of them duel against Fiona and Athena, which resulted in Fiona shooting him in the foot. You shot me in my pinky toe! After knocking Athena out with a rocket launcher, the two vault hunters then take her back to Sanctuary to be interrogated. In Borderlands the pre-sequel, Brick is seen in the introduction alongside Mordecai limping away after Lilith noted how it took the two to capture Athena. Brick's heart also almost melts after Lilith calls them her best men. She said we're her best men. That makes me feel good. Ow. In the final scene, Brick raises his objections along with Mordecai about executing Athena to Lilith. Despite this, Lilith went ahead and ordered the Crimson Raider soldiers to execute Athena, only for the bullets to be stopped by the Watcher. In Borderlands 3, during the mission Hammerlocked, Brick, Mordecai, Tiny Tina and the Vault Hunter are hired by Wainwright Jacobs to rescue Sir Hammerlock. Brick's call sign during this mission is Meat Slab. Sometimes Brick's genius is... it's almost frightening. Skills Brick's action skill is a berserk mode in which the screen goes red. He holsters his weapon and proceeds to beat the living shit out of anything he sees. Bandits? Dead. Innocent civilians? Dead. <laughs> Those flowers you got for your mum on Mother's Day that she really liked and you specifically ordered all the way from Eden 6 dead! During this time, Brick also gains resistance to all damage and his health will generate at a rapid rate as he beats down enemies. Brick's Berserk mode is controlled with the analog sticks and by using the aim button for a powerful but slower left hook and the shoot button for a quicker but weaker right jab. Several of his class mods are also dedicated towards improving effectiveness of Berserk and can make it a very viable primary method of combat. Strategy Punch Okay, moving on to fun fact only joking. <laughs> Rick is an optimal character for close combat. He is well equipped to use shotguns and explosives, and is also a very potent brawler with his fists when he slips into a berserker rage. 
Some say he is best played as a tank or brawler, as he talents that reinforce him to withstand harm, empowers his brawling capabilities, and aid any explosive weaponry that he might use. Okay, now it's time for the facts that happen to be fun. Brick's family is referenced in several places throughout the first game. His sister is the reason for him being on Pandora, she is missing and he has to find her, and his mother is also referenced in Mad Max's Underdome Riot as getting past a certain round. Apparently, she was as good a fighter as he is. Pictured on wanted posters in the secret army of General Knox, Brick has the highest bounty on his head at $9,999,999.99. His listed crime is murder and dismemberment of anything that moves. Sounds accurate. This bounty would later be topped by Gage at 820 billion. Bro's got that Hyperion money. This shares a distinction as well with Salvador in the fact that they both end in 99 cents. In Borderlands 2, Handsome Jack raises Brick's bounty in a radio broadcast to $8 billion. The letters TCB, with a lightning bolt, are emblazoned on Brick's belt buckle. This was a signature of Elvis Presley that meant taking care of business in a flash. In Borderlands 2, the TCB emblem is missing from Brick's belt buckle. In Borderlands 2, it is revealed that Brick got a second dog called Dusty after the defeat of the Destroyer, but lost her during the Hyperion attack on New Haven. The Sheriff of Lynchwood, Nisha, reveals that she was the one who killed her by breaking her neck in front of Brick, making him cry. In Borderlands 2, Brick wears two dog paws around his neck, representing Priscilla and Dusty, respectively. As in Borderlands 3, he also wears a third dog paw representing Tahoe. And finally, in Borderlands 2, Brick has apparently obtained Sledge's hammer and carries it on his back. If he is unable to engage a target in melee, he will throw the hammer. Also, it just occurred to me now that Brick had dogs, not Skags, like he actually had physical dogs. Meaning that dogs exist in the same universe as Skags. Meaning, does that mean there's like Skag versions of cats? Oh shit, they're just jabbers, aren't they? Oh, are, they mon are they monkey cat? I don't know. The man with the unbreakable fists. Brick is known for being as strong as a boulder, and as sharp as one too, but combats that with an innate love for the people around him and a heart of gold, even if it sometimes comes across in a weird and hostile way. I, I think it's safe to say that even with all the punching, screaming, and bald-headedness, we could all do with Brick in our lives. Now, we're moving on to the fan-favourite game with some of the most beloved characters in the whole series. The characters of the second game, I'm sure, hold a very special place in all of our hearts, whether it be for one reason or another. I think it's safe to say that these are the playable characters that indulged most of us into the series, and were potentially the first Vault Hunters that we ever played in the Borderlands franchise. Coming three years after the first game, the second batch of four characters had more room to become more fleshed out in their skills, backstories, playstyles, and appearances. Maya, the Siren, who can face lock her enemies in a stasis bubble to help her control the field of battle. Salvador, the Gunzerker, who can unleash a wild barrage of gunfire as he launches into a gun-waving battle frenzy. Also, resembles a fist with hair stippled to it. Axton, the Commando, who can deploy a saber turret, dramatically increasing the available firepower on the field of battle. And Zero, the Number, who is a number and enjoys normal things, like having four fingers and speaking in fucking haikus. Did I also mention He's a numb. Being able to shadow himself in a decoy, he lurks in the shadows waiting for the opportunity to strike. After a while, we were also graced with two more sneaky fuckers who apparently also made their way onto the train without paying for a ticket. And people wonder why train staff go on strike. They found a way to introduce themselves into our lives, and boy did they become just as popular as the other four. Gage the Mechromancer, who can summon a powerful battle robot Death Trap to help sweep the battlefield. And Krieg, the Psycho, who can go into a bloody rage by putting away his guns then pulling out his two-handed buzz axe. With these four, and eventually six, characters teamed up together, they became the perfect force to rip, tear, and shred their way straight into the world of Pandora, through Handsome Jack's mask, and into our minds forever. We start off the venture into the characters of the second game with the person who 100% started the simp movement. The blue-haired, Malawan welding, sharpshooting, love of my so-called life, Maya the fucking Siren. I'm back, bitches! Maya is the Siren class of Borderlands 2, and the third ever Siren we come to know in the Borderlands franchise after Lilith and Commandant Steel. She is originally from the planet Athenus, and is one of six Sirens that can exist in the universe at one given point. She is one of the six playable characters in Borderlands 2, and an NPC character in Borderlands 3. Background As an infant, 
Maya was identified as a siren and given to the Order of the Impending Storm, the ruling order of the monks on her homeworld of Athenus. She trained her siren powers in secret until she reached adulthood, when the monks revealed her to the public as the goddess and saviour. See what I mean about the simp shit now? People of Athenus, after years of training and preparation, the Order of the Impending Storm is ready to reveal your saviour! Speak, Maya! Speak to your subjects! Uh, hi. Irritated by the Order's short leash, she longed for adventure and expressed her interest in travelling to Pandora to learn more about her siren lineage. She eventually realised that the Order was using her as a threat to extort money and obedience from the people of Athenus. After phase locking and executing her handler brother Sophus, she headed to Pandora to finally satisfy her curiosity about the sirens. Maya already knew of the vault and the presence of Iridium before arriving on Pandora, and after Handsome Jack learned of Maya through Hyperion surveillance footage, it presumably didn't take much effort to get the siren on the train at the beginning of the game. Upon disembarking the train and standing on the train platform, Maya is surprised when she spots a bandit named Krieg staring back at her. Once again, the Simp Chronicles continue. When he tries calling out to her, Maya believes him to have malevolent intent and begins shooting at him. As this goes on, a swarm of rats begin approaching Maya, who is unaware of the danger. Maya is only saved due to Krieg screaming out a warning and killing a rat with his buzzsaw. She proceeds to help kill most of the rats and as she leaves, Krieg calls out to her once more. This time, Maya forms a slight smile in appreciation for him saving her life. It could have been me! Involvement. After the events of Borderlands 2, Maya decided to travel back to Athenus and serve as the planet's protector. Before she left Pandora to return back home, Maya is surprised to encounter Krieg once again. Sensing that he was upset and trying to express his disappointment about her leaving him behind on Pandora, Maya comforts Krieg and promises him to come back and see him someday. While on Athenus, Maya is informed about a thief named Ava who tried stealing one of her books in the monastery. Sensing that the girl was a potential siren, Maya took her in as an apprentice. After stopping Malawan's invasion of Athenus in search for the Vault Key, Maya and Ava join the Crimson Raiders in the fight against the Calypsos. At the Vault on Promethea, Ava confronts Maya on being left on Sanctuary 3 while the Rampager fight was fought. When Tyrene Calypso later takes Ava hostage, Maya puts Troy Calypso in a chokehold to try bartering Ava's life for his. However, None of the people present were aware that Troy could leech off other sirens, as he had always relied on Tyrene, and thus, Maya was promptly disintegrated and killed after Troy leeched her powers. For legal reasons, my lawyer has advised I keep my opinions to myself as much as I really don't fucking want to. The Vault Hunters would later avenge her death by killing Troy, allowing her powers to pass on to Ava as she is intended. Suck shit, MGK! Skills. Maya's action skill is called Phase Lock. It's similar in name to Lilith's power of phase walk, however, it's based on restricting enemies rather than enhancing her. Maya's skill gives her the ability to suspend foes in another dimension. This can lock an opponent in a stasis and can be upgraded to provide various damaging effects. This skill is useful for crowd control in both co-op and single player mode. Repeatedly phase locking the enemy results in diminishing returns, and she can also add elemental effects such as corrosive, slag and fire by upgrading her skill tree later on. Strategy! Maya's playstyle typically involves heavily elemental based damage. Her preferred weapon types are SMGs, with the use of her cat class mods improving all SMG based attacks. By upgrading her phase lock with abilities like Cloud Kill, she is able to dish out large area of effects attacks, with massive damage capabilities. Thought Lock causes enemies to become confused and fight amongst each other, allowing Maya to focus her fire elsewhere. This, paired with her Scorn skill, allowing her to throw an orb of slag, results in a hot and sticky mess, results in enemies getting covered in Goo. Results in enemy. They die, okay? Now for the best fun facts, because they are about Maya. Can you tell she is my favourite character in the franchise? Maya is wanted for the crime of being a siren. Racism. The bounty on her head is $720 billion. Maya's backstory echo recordings are located in the Wildlife Exploitation Preserve. The recordings override earlier promotional material regarding her age, making her at least 27 years of age instead of 25. According to Mad Moxie, Maya gives her a lady boner. According to a dialogue in Psycho Krieg and the Fantastic Fuster Cluck, Maya's natural hair colour is actually not blue, but she spends a lot of money on hair dye. Finally, if the Vault Hunters speak to her in Sanity's Sanctum, she'll express concern for Ava, worrying that she didn't adequately prepare her before her death. 
Maya, Maya, Maya. What can I say about her that I haven't already said before? Whether that be in this video or many other videos before this. She is easily my favourite character ever, without fail. From the way her skill works to the use of my favourite brand and type of weapon being her preferred weapon type, Malawan SMGs, because they also made me feel a different type of way. There's just something about Maya that makes me want to make another save file of her right now, and hopefully I've convinced you two too. Moving past my thoughts on how she was later treated in Borderlands 3, which is a tragedy in my opinion, I will still always have her to play as in Borderlands 2, and that's really all that matters. Rest easy, Maya. In before the... What a simple bro loves Maya comments. Yeah, so what? Suck my pixie dick. Now we move swiftly on. Next up is a local boy with height issues and a seemingly unlimited supply of ammo shoved up his ass. It's the shortest truck to can on Pandora, the man who resembles the floor of a barbershop, Salvador, the dual welding gunzerker. I am having fun! Salvador is the gunzerker class of Borderlands 2. His action skill, Gunzerking, allows him to dual wield any two weapons in the game temporarily. He only returns again once in the series with a small role as an NPC in Borderlands 3's arms race mode. Have we got an opportunity for you? You don't want to me Background. Age 36, Salvador is a local born and raised Pandorian. He stands at a height of 5 foot 4 or 163 centimeters. This stunted growth is revealed to be due to heavy steroid use throughout his life. You don't fucking say. Despite his love for excessive violence being aimed towards bandits and criminals, Salvador was nonetheless about to be executed by the people of his hometown of Overhas for his actions. When a Hyperion strike team arrived to seize the town, Sally destroyed the invading forces and, because of this, becomes interested in the new vault upon hearing of its dangers while interrogating the last survivor of the strike team. He then made the heroic decision to let him crawl back to Hyperion on a single arm, as Salvador had ripped off his other arm and broken both his legs. Absolute unit involvement. After the defeat of Handsome Jack, Salvador sticks around for a few years, helping the various characters around Sanctuary with their respective problems and defeating Hector after Sanctuary became under siege. He then just apparently decided, fuck this, after a few more years and goes on the run, be mentioned as so in the Guns, Loves and Tentacles DLC. He had a keen interest in Xylurgos, having run up an incredibly large bar tab at the lodge, and then promptly left again. With becoming incredibly famous from the vault opening on Pandora a few years before, Salvador had gotten quite a few requests to become front and centre in his own show, and whilst originally displaying no interest in the matter, he eventually got sick and tired of moving from planet to planet, running up bar tabs and fleeing. He wanted a sort of stability in his life, and so him, alongside an old companion and friend of his, Axton, decided to take up the offer of hosting the newly created arms race show on the Echonet. Celebrity status they had already achieved had now been capitalised on, and that would be his title for the foreseeable future. Whether he is still affiliated with the Crimson Raiders, however, is unknown. Yeah, they botched him. You can sort of tell Gearbox just had no fucking idea what to do with this guy. Like, does hosting an Echonet show sound like something Salvador would realistically do? Exactly. Skills. Gunzerking allows Salvador to dual weld two guns of any type at the same time. His Rampage and Gunlust trees offer further augment in his dual wield skills and amplify weapon capabilities, whilst the Brawn skill tree boosts the amount of damage Salvador can take and dish out. He also restores some of his health and heals constantly for the entire duration. He also loves to scream like an absolute maniac when given the chance, saying beautiful and admiring phrases such as <laughs> And don't forget what a way with words he has. Strategy. Sally can pretty much succeed with any type of weapon in the game. Whether it's a sniper rifle and a rocket launcher paired together, such as the Pimpernel and the Ahab, or a shotgun and a pistol like the interface from the Grog Nozzle. The specific build just mentioned with the Pimpernel and the Ahab is a very well-known glitched build, known as the Pimpahab build. These two guns, paired with the skill Money Shot, which allows the last shot in the magazine to deal a massive damage boost and a Monk class mod, result in an incredibly high DPS that can kill most of the bosses in the game without Lil Sally dripping a single drop of sweat. It essentially gives the sniper rifle the damage of the rocket launcher, which is one of the highest damage guns in the game by the way, and that paired with the sniper rifle's critical hit bonus and slag effects make for a very good time for you, and a very bad one for practically anything else. This build is very controversial, however, as it is considered too easy and a cheese to use. 
The most paired weapons you will see with the Gunzerker has to be the double penetrating unkempt Harold and the Grog Nozzle. The high projectile count and the high damage of the Harold, paired with the slag effects, health regen and the drunk mode of the Grog Nozzle, which multiplies projectiles but slows down the fire rate, makes for a very reliable, if not quite high ammo consumption based build. Okay, you better get ready. It's time for Salvador fun facts time. And there is a lot of fun facts. Salvador is wanted for a number of crimes, including manslaughter, theft, arson, destruction of property, trespassing, cannibalism, public indecency, and profanity. He has the most crimes of any Vault Hunter in any Borderlands game, and the fourth highest bounty after Krieg, Maya, and Gage in Borderlands 2. Salvador is Spanish and Portuguese for savior. Many of Salvador's skill names are references to pop culture and film. Go watch my video on that. Link in the description. Plug, 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 plug. Go watch it. Go watch Salvador is the only known playable character to be born in and raised on Pandora. He has a tattoo on his index fingers. Right on the right one, spelled R-I-T-E. And wrong on the left, spelled wrong. The gun zerking lines, time to compensate and screw you Freud, are a complex reference to Freudian psychology. According to Freud, firearms are considered to be symbols of masculinity, leading to the common belief that they are often used to overcompensate for poor self-esteem in men. Salvador's short stature is a classic definition of Napoleon complex, aka short man syndrome, as well as the quintessential game theory definite game theory. Matt Pat, welcome to game theory. And finally, Salvador's class mod is represented by ammo crates above his waist. The fist with hair staple to him is an incredible example of give a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man to dual wield guns, he breaks the game forever. Sally is such a fun character to play, but god damn, towards the end game he gets incredibly boring nowadays. It's not that he's too easy to use per se, it's just that I initially played with him so much that I got bored of the whole grab the deeper and the grog nozzle and go brrrr till enemies perish type fighting style. Most broken character in any of the Borderlands games, except maybe Moe's, but it's very close. I will love you forever, you short king. Thank you, Salvador. You've heard of him. Moxie definitely knows him. Robot companies lock their shops because of him. His wife kind of sort of hates him, but also not really. She still kind of loves him, but in a platonic way, so please don't get any ideas. It's Axton. And the crowd goes wild! <sighs> Axton is the playable commando class in Borderlands 2. He is from the planet Hieronymus and has access to a high-tech Dahl saber turret who he is also in love with. Background. Originally from Hieronymus, which out of nowhere fun fact, is actually the name of one of the Gearbox lead devs' last name. Super sick name, not gonna lie. Axton spent 10 years with the Dahl military force, reaching the rank of sergeant. After his pursuit of personal glory and disregard for orders led to numerous compromise missions, his wife and commanding officer Sarah simultaneously divorced him and discharged him from the military. Sarah made it a point to highlight that this would lead to his death by firing squad, then ordered him to definitely not flee to any of the numerous border worlds beyond Dahl's reach. Taking her not-so-subtle suggestion, Axton went AWOL, using his skills and turret as a mercenary on other planets. Axton became aware of the vault thanks to a radio advertisement orchestrated by Handsome Jack, who had been monitoring the commando's most recent bounty hunt. Although Axton was turning in more bounties and making far more money than anyone else in share of Young's Blood's jurisdiction, he found that it was way too easy, and the lure of fame, fortune, and challenging combat drew him to Pandora. Involvement his life after opening the vault is similar to Salvador. By the events of Borderlands 3, Axon had since become a model of one of Moses' Iron Bear skins prominently features a half-naked pin-up of Axton. Character assassination at its finest. With becoming incredibly famous from the vault opening on Pandora, Axton had gotten quite a few requests to become front and centre in his own show. Not that kind of show. He was incredibly keen to jump in on the action, as he had already been involved in a similar style project with Gage only a few years before. He thought it would be a natural fit, and so him, alongside an old companion and friend of his, Salvador, decided to take up the offer of hosting the newly created arms race show on the Echonet. The celebrity status they had already achieved had now been capitalised on, and that would be his title for the foreseeable future. Whether he is still affiliated with the Crimson Raiders, however, much like Sally, is unknown. Skills 
With inspiration from Roland's role in the first Borderlands, Axin is able to deploy a versatile Dahl Saber turret, a mounted gun featuring 360 degree rotation that can be upgraded with many weapons and abilities. The general expansion of skills in the second game means that the Saber turret is pretty much just a better version of the Scorpio turret from the first game. Dahl Supremacy bit. Gearbox now knew what the fuck they were doing and allowed Axin to acquire a second gun, an extra turret, rocket pods, and even a goddamn nuke that would explode upon deployment of the Saber. Hey, stand in front of it! Whilst these were really good skills that are unbelievably cool to unlock and slam into the thing, the drop-off that the turret can have in Ultimate Vault into mode is quite disappointing, relying on the second turret, which fires slag rounds, to cause status effects to get any real damage going. Strategy Axton works very well with assault rifles, but most of the usual suspects at the conference call, Uncrempt Harold, Norfleet, etc. are all great for Axton. Some of the weapons that are good for him are going to be the weapons that benefit from grenade damage increase, because your skills increase grenade damage quite a lot. Certain weapons actually do more damage. The Torg Ogre is actually a really good example. It's an assault rifle paired with the high explosive damage and a Vladov spinny barrel. It makes a trusty sidearm for him. Pair something like that with the legendary soldier class mod and you're looking at a lot more damage and a gun that goes fucking mrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Tannis, just give give them here. In the optional mission in the Son of Chromarax DLC, it is also made aware that a suspected companion of Zero called One exists. This could add to the theory that there is a whole bunch of assassins with numbers as nicknames, whether they are simply associates have worked together or the same species is unknown, however. Yeah, that's another thing that I think Gearbox has just completely forgotten about, as Zero is one of the most interesting characters and one of two characters that came back in Borderlands 3's base game, but something like that wasn't even mentioned, let alone expanded upon. I mean, hopefully in the future we can learn about this one character and their greater involvement with Zero's past, but I kind of doubt it. Involvement. Following a mission given by Moxie, Zero chases after the bandit lord Bossa Nova in search of a Gortius core. What's that sound? <laughs> They crash into the world of curiosities, where Reese and Vaughn are in the process of dealing with August for a vault key. Bossa Nova runs off with Reese's money, leaving Zero to deal with several psychos. Later, Zero tracks Bossa Nova to his hideout, an abandoned Atlas warehouse, and makes his way inside. He later saves Reese and Sasha from a skag and takes a lift with them to the center arena, where Bossa Nova is hosting a death race event. Upon spotting Zero, Bossa Nova issues a $20,000 reward to anyone who can kill him. I mean, 20k, is that it? I mean, bloody hell, man, that's nothing. Zero engages in combat with Bossa Nova and his bandits, and eventually emerges victorious. He then reports the situation back to Moxie while commenting on not having found the Gortis core. Gortis is not here. Don't sweat it, babe. That's one less bandit lord we have to worry about. There's plenty of time for sweating later. Once you come back to me for your reward. My quest is not done. <laughs> Unbeknownst to him, the core was hidden below him and is later found by Reese and Fiona. If the player identifies Fiona as a Vault Hunter back in Episode 3, Zero will be available as a team member in the fight against the Traveller. Zero is one of two Vault Hunters that stayed in contact with the Crimson Raiders, the other being Maya. And after the events of Tales from the Borderlands, he starts working for Reese under the Atlas Corporation, doing different types of jobs for him. Later on, it is thought that Zero had betrayed Reese and teamed up with Malawan and Katagawa, but it is revealed that Zero was just Katagawa in a replica Zero costume. After Katagawa is defeated and the Malawan invasion had been repelled, Zero once again joins up with the Crimson Raiders and gives out bounties for the newest Vault Hunters to complete on Sanctuary 3. Skills Deception grants Zero the ability to deploy a holographic decoy of himself and enter an invisible stealth mode. While cloaked, he can manoeuvre about the battlefield, dealing amplified damage on his next attack. The longer Zero stays cloaked, the more damage he can inflict to enemies. However, the shorter Zero stayed cloaks, the sooner he's able to use the skill again. Zero does not enter a separate dimension like Lilith when she phase walks, and can still take damage from all sources while cloaked. Much like Roland and Axton, Zero's skill is a clear inspiration from Lilith's skill in the first game, with slight differences here and there making them have a clear enough distinction. Strategy Zero has an innate fondness for sniper rifles, having an entire skill tree literally titled Sniping. It also suits his background and his namesake of being the Assassin. He is also highly effective with SMGs and pistols, however. Zero can unlock a skill at the end of his cunning skill tree called Death Blossom. This gives Zero access to elemental based kunai that he can use while Deception is active and does not reveal his position. These are very effective and have a very high status effect against enemies. His infamous Boar skill, part of the sniping skill tree, is part of many Zero builds. This makes his bullets capable of penetrating through an unlimited amount of targets, offering a 100% damage bonus per enemy pierced. A classic build for Zero involves the B Legendary Shield, paired with a unique Sandhawk SMG and an investment in the Boar skill. With the high projectile count of the Sandhawk, the damage amplification that you get from equipping the B Shield, and the penetration bonus of Boar, bosses like the Bunker, Hyperius, and the Warrior can be dealt with incredibly quickly, as they have a lot of damage through penetration. Very nice. The Infinity Pistol was always seen with builds of Zero, especially in the early days of Borderlands 2. See, as the Infinity has... Well, it's in the fucking name. And Zero has a lot of skills which give extra first shot bonus damage, critical hit damage, fire rate increases, extra shot chances, accuracy, bullet speed, and once again, fucking bore in the B-Shield. It made Zero easily the best character in the game with the Infinity Pistol. Now, it is the time. Facts don't need to be fun, but I hope these are. Most of Zero's dialogue is spoken in haiku, which is noted once by Hanson Jack in an echo recorder. Leaves falling from trees. Snow drifting onto the ground. Life leaving your corpse. Did that guy just speak in haiku? Zero's version of the Slayer of Terramorphous class mod was once bugged, providing a bonus to one of the other playable characters, Salvador. It has since been fixed in a patch. Thank Christ. 
When using the Handsome Jack voice modulator later on in the campaign, Zero will become far less talkative. Many of his lines are replaced with lines that are cut short, as though Zero was about to say something, heard his own voice, and decided against it. Zero's wanted poster has the code 000 000 000 HSP. The joke being that the entire numerical code is just zeros, as a part of a running gag Zero has with respective numbers. In Mad Moxie and the Wedding Day Massacre, the reward head for Zero shows a robotic eye in his shattered helmet. A promotional description stated, It should be said that his new head is named Not Cannon for a reason, keeping Zero's true race and head a mystery. And lastly, Zero speaks in a completely different voice in Episode 5 of Tales from the Borderlands, using a less husky, more formal sounding voice. That was so easy! Yes, way easier. This might change everything. Boy, if you don't get this new voice has been widely criticized for being a rather unfitting change to Zero's character. People wanted it to go back to the old voice. Zero is also famously known for displaying holographs on his faceplate, revealing his emotions through these. These include some of these I'm just shown right now. Just yeah, that one as well. And this one. Ah, uh, that one. Ooh. Ooh, I like that one. Hmm, I don't like that one very much. Yep. And another one. There's a lot. There, there's a lot. Honestly, if it wasn't for Boar, a lot of people probably wouldn't play Zero. But I generally wasn't even aware of how effective Boar could be until I saw like a Jolts video six years ago. And I still love Zero even without knowing that. His aesthetic, voice, customization, mystery, and love for sniper rifles and melee made me see how unique Zero really could be in character creation. Especially since he was the only character at the time to be able to fully rely on melee damage to be a viable strategy. A massive fan favourite that I'm sure will stick around for a while, as long as things don't get too easy. Whilst he didn't get expanded much in 3, I loved him in 2. You'll always be good with the gun that has a magazine size of 1. Much love, Zero. Now, we're moving on to the DLC characters, starting with one of my favourites. The girl that will sacrifice body parts for science, the planner of her own crush's wedding, Hatchet welding, robot loving, DT creating, and hater of coming second after Marcy Holloway in the science fair, it's Gage the Mecromancer. Anarchy forever and ever! Gage is the playable Mecromancer class in Borderlands 2, and the fifth playable class overall in Borderlands 2. First revealed at PAX East 2012, Gage was added as a post-release downloadable content character and was the first ever DLC character in the Borderlands franchise. She is originally from the Moon Eden 5 and created Death Trap, her trusty robot companion. Background Gage was a high school student from the Moon Eden 5 and lovingly supported in her endeavours by her parents and particularly her father. She would often echo cast live about what's going on in her life and had about a dozen subscribers to her channel, although this dropped over a time or two. Gage found the history behind the vaults, Iridium and Pandora to be particularly fascinating and considered her era to be the most awesomely awesome time period in history to be living in. She was in fact, not wrong. She originally conceived Death Trap, then called the mechanized Anti-Bullying Deterrent Test, or Project DT, as a science fair project to combat bullying. Her rival, Marcy Holloway, was a contestant in the science fair as well, and used her father's money to buy her way through the competition. After Gage was inspired to amputate her left arm with a particle saw and replacing it with a robotic one she bought, Marcy apparently stole Gage's DT designs and sold them to the Eden 5 corrupt police force. On the day of the science fair in the school auditorium, Marcy's father bribed the judges, helping her win first place with a defective robot based on Death Trap's first or second revision blueprints. Gage, with at least a fourth revision Death Trap, placed second. Marcy then shoved Gage, causing Death Trap to identify her as hostile. Death Trap attacked with its Digistruct claws. She then proceeded to go to the ER over a slight scratch, and of course that didn't happen. Marcy fucking exploded all over the place into little red chunks. This was likely due to a miscalibration of the claws by Gage, when she had added the Discord circuits the night before. After the auditorium was cleaned up of Marcy's remains, the traumatized Gage was escorted to the principal's office and faced expulsion and arrest for accidentally murdering her rival. She called her father to create a distraction to help her evade arrest, which apparently consisted of the novel use of a golf cart and lots of gasoline. Gage and her father realized she would have to leave Eden 5 so the police and her misappropriated intervention couldn't find her, and after an emotional farewell, she bought a transplanetary shuttle ticket to Pandora to become a vault hunter. 
echo casting during the journey, she was shocked to find that her two subscriber count had jumped to 20,000 because of the science fair incident, and it had also been reported on the echo net. People apparently found her channel, and she, after she'd explained what happened in the subsequent fallout, she landed on Pandora. She ended up stowing away on a Hyperion train, and she ended up meeting five other mysterious characters. Her life after that moment changed forever. Involvement. Gage never appears in any of the Borderlands main stories again. Seeming how she basically ended up being a hero of Pandora pretty much by accident, she deemed the situation temporary and decided to proceed with more normal ventures moving forwards. She became a wedding planner and organised the event of Wainwright Jacobs and Alastair Hammerlock, whom she had developed a crush on several years earlier during the events of Borderlands 2. One can only imagine the inner conflict Gage had to endure throughout that process. Skills. Gage's skill grants her the ability to control the D374-TP, or Death Trap, a super-sized levitating robot that can be utilised in multiple different ways, from spinning claw attacks, to lasery eyes of death, to electric balls of death. I'm seeing a theme here. <coughs> there isn't anything Death Trap can't do, at least according to Gage herself. Sort of like Axton's Saber Turret, DT drops a lot damage-wise the higher levels you get into Ultimate Vault Hunter mode. And it's, it's a real shame, because I absolutely love Gage as a character and DT as a concept for an action skill. It just seems that the AI DT was built around wasn't very good, even for the time, and hasn't aged very well. With him even attacking the player on occasion, which, whilst lore accurate in a sense, clearly is not meant to happen in-game. Even with the unofficial community patch, DT still isn't the best skill out there to use. But, fuck it, I love him anyway. Strategy Anarchy! Gage is very famously very good with anarchy builds. Anarchy only has one skill point. With it, Gage gains an anarchy stack whenever she kills an enemy or fires every bullet from a weapons magazine. Each anarchy stack adds 1.75% to her gun damage, but lowers her accuracy by 1.75% in exchange. Anarchy does not wear off by itself and continues to add stacks with each subsequent kill or emptied magazine. Death Trap kills do not grant anarchy stacks, however. The Rational Anarchist and Typecast Iconoclast skills may cause more than one stack to be gained at once. If Gage reloads before the magazine is completely empty, she will either trigger Discord if she has it or lose all of her anarchy stacks. She will also begin to lose anarchy at a rate of roughly 5 stacks per second while crippled, but getting a second win will stop the loss of anarchy stacks. Dying, in most cases, exiting the game or resetting skill points will remove all anarchy stacks. Anarchy stacks are also consumed by death from above and with claws. Also, there's a funny way you can get around gaining anarchy stacks. If you want to get max stacks before going into battle, you can simply go to the target in Sanctuary and then just continue to keep resetting your magazine, just keep emptying the magazine over and over again. You can get max stacks pretty fast. It's a, it's a pretty good viable strategy. Anarchy stacks have a default maximum of 150, giving her a maximum potential benefit of 262.5% gun damage at the cost of minus 262.5% accuracy. Fully investing in the pre-shrunk cyberpunk skill extends the limit to 400 stacks, increasing the benefit of up to 700% gun damage and minus 700% accuracy. Like, fuck me. Trying to hit something with minus 700% accuracy is like trying to hit a target 10 foot away whilst you're drunk pissing in 50 mile an hour winds. Shit ain't happening. Using the Slayer of Terramorphous class mod allows for up to 600 stacks of anarchy. Are you ready? Are you ready for the number? Are you prepared for the number? 1050% gun damage and minus 1050% Accuracy. Yeah, I need not explain why Anarchy is so good now, eh? Paired with the Norfleet, Slagger, Maggie, Interfacer, Unkempt Harold, or the Flacker, you cannot lose. Loads of projectiles, don't even need to aim. Accuracy is overrated anyways. I really want to stop mentioning facts about the characters that are fun, but I'm legally obligated to. Gage is the first playable character to not have an echo log in her inventory at the start of the game, nor does she have a personal trophy or achievement for the use of her personal skill. The intro of the game wasn't renewed after her release, so she was the first playable character who isn't featured in the intro of the game. Gage and Death Trap are, however, featured in the Captain Scarlet and her Pirate's Booty intro together with the four original Vault Hunters. She is also seen more prominently in the Sir Hamlock's Big Game Hunt intro movie. 
In the intro of Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon's Keep, a gauge figurine is seen on the table during the scene where Tina is explaining the available character classes. She is also seen in the silhouette during the ending with the rest of the Vault Hunters. Gage likes cupcakes and hot chocolate, and her favourite colour is purple. Gage also dislikes country music. According to Mad Moxie and the Wedding Day Massacre DLC, Gage seems to have a crush on Sir Hammerlock, and she has a very close relationship with Axton, calling him an unparalleled stud according to their chat with Athena. One of her random lines while opening treasure chests, It's like Hanukkah, is a parody of Roland's It's like Christmas. The bounty on Gage's head is, get this, $820 billion, which is the highest among all playable characters to date. She is wanted for the, and I quote, creation of unauthorized technology and excessive adorability. No wanted posters of Gage exist in the game, however, the 820 billion figure is from her intro movie. When using the Handsome Jack voice modulator, Gage's voice remains the same the first time it is picked up. Testing, testing one, two, one, two. Oh, and now I have the voice of a douchebag. Great. Only the English voice of Gage using the voice modulator currently exists, being played in all versions of the game. She also doesn't use any of her anarchy stack game quotes while using Jack's voice. Yeah! When building stacks of anarchy, Gage's personality undergoes a gradual shift from normal, to highly excited, to full-blown god complex and fourth wall breaking. Original concept art of Gage featured her robot hand as being more crude and with only four digits. The arm in her final design has a full set of digits and has a more completed appearance. Aside from the arm, little else seemed to have been changed from the original design. And the last one for Gage, Gage's Necromancer class mod introduced in Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon's Keep is the only class mod from that DLC to not be named after a standard playable class in Dungeons and Dragons. Easily my second favourite playable character in Borderlands history, from a character point of view, not necessarily from an in-game one. It saddened me that she didn't initially return in Borderlands 3, and when she did, I was obviously happy to see her, but I still kind of felt like the character of Gage had been assassinated a tiny bit and... I feel like they only brought her back for the sake of fan service. Nonetheless, she's fun as hell to play in Borderlands 2, whether that be trying to hit the broadside of a barn with a fucking rocket launcher, or screaming ANARCHY at the top of your lungs every single time she gains a stack. DT is great in the first stages of the game, and I adore her quirky voice lines. Her actress, Seremi Lee, does not get enough credit for her performance in the game. If it were up to me, you'd have got first place in the science fair gauge. You were the people's first place. Oh yeah, and fuck Marcy Holloway. Lastly, for all Vault Hunters in Borderlands 2, we've got an S-tier character and easily in the top three best protagonists in the whole Borderlands franchise. Hell, if not one of the best in gaming. The Manic, the Hellborn, the rider of bicycles that starts stinking after a few days out in the sun, the conductor of his very own train, the ultimate Maya simp, Krieg the Psycho. Say thank you. Nipple salads! Close enough. Krieg is the playable Psycho class character in Borderlands 2. His home planet is currently unknown, but honestly, I don't even think Krieg knows where he's from, let's be honest with each other. He is the sixth and final playable character in the game, and was revealed on March 24th, 2013 in the Borderlands 2 Krieg the Psycho character reveal trailer, and was the second ever DLC character ever introduced to the Borderlands franchise. Background. As a child, Krieg endured abuse from his mother, who viewed him as weakling. Prior to being captured by Hyperion, he worked as a bounty hunter tracking down fugitives and mercenaries, which can sort of explain at least part of why he's so efficient at killing. Seeing as how most psychos simply just run as fast as their skimpy little bodies let them, head on towards the enemy like a fleshy claymore, you can kind of tell. Dr. Benedict, a Hyperion scientist, used Krieg and other captured bandits as experiments to become psychos subjected to horrible abuse and experiments, with the lucky ones being the first to die as each surviving batch only endured even more inhumane experiments where traits like self-harm, suicidal impulses, and reckless behaviour were encouraged. Rather than bringing out his psychotic side and destroying his sanity, it only made him feel more powerless. Eventually, a fractured remnant of his psyche manifests itself as an inner voice in his mind, as a means for Krieg's sane side to maintain hope and the will to survive. Learning that he was to be disposed of with the rest of the subjects and Dr. Benedict planned on using children as the next group, he broke out of the facility and killed Benedict to prevent them from suffering the same fate. However, by that point, Psycho Krieg became the dominant personality and Krieg could no longer communicate properly. Later on in his life, Krieg had engaged in a Vault Hunter-esque activities and worked for the Crimson Raiders, such as aiding the needy and getting paid with loot. 
The voice also seeks to control Krieg's lust for murder by limiting his victims to those deriving punishment. However, because of the Psycho Krieg's personality, he was unable to establish any meaningful bonds with the Raiders and believed they always hated him and saw him as a weapon towards their enemies. Anthony Birch has described Krieg's psychosis, comparing Krieg to a man driving an out of control truck. He cannot stop the truck, but he can try to steer it away from as many incidents as possible. Players are introduced to Krieg as he wanders through Pandora's wasteland, eliminating bandits with his buzz axe. He encounters Maya, who initially believes him to be hostile. She immediately opens fire on him, inadvertently attracting the attention of a group of rats. To focus on Krieg, Maya fails to notice the rats approaching from behind. Stupid, I'm not gonna let you get the chance. Krieg salvages the situation by throwing his buzz axe at the rats, saving Maya from peril. Afterwards, Maya warms up to Krieg, and the two congregate. Yes, he's a simp. Slushy... Im... Involvement. After the events of Handsome Jack's attempt to destroy the Crimson Raiders, Krieg exiles himself away in the wastes of Pandora, having become smitten with Maya and wishing to see her again. His inner voice tries to coach himself into speaking more coherently and overall act less hostile around others, with limited success. During this time, Tiny Tina manages to find Krieg and wishes to have him instruct her on behaving like a bandit more. Shortly after the destruction of Sanctuary, he hears about Maya going back to Athenus and goes to track her down. With some effort, Krieg is able to convey a message to her, wishing that she would stay. While upset over her determination to return back to her home planet, Krieg takes some solace in Maya promising to return back to Pandora and see him again. I swear to god, the Krieg DLC should have just been him finding out how Maya died and being put in a room with Ava for like 5 minutes. Like, just that. Tanis had been studying the minds of psychos of Pandora and believed she had found a common thread within every single one of them, something mysterious and elusive that she had dubbed Voltala. This led her and the Vault Hunters to explore the inside of Krieg's mind to find the answers. Along the way they find trauma that he's had to endure, the pain of losing Maya, and the realisation that he'll have to let her go eventually, no matter how much he wants her to stay. Such a good DLC by the way, and the best DLC in Borderlands 3 for sure. Maybe even top 3 of all time after Dragon's Keep and Claptrap's DLC. Skills. Krieg is, of course, a psycho. And so, welds a trusty buzz act. Buzz act? Welds a trusty buzz axe, which is his preferred way of fucking up a peaceful nomad's day. <laughs> When his skill is triggered, he gains a 500% melee damage boost, regains all his health on the kill, and becomes a speedy boy. Alright, so think about it this way. It's basically the video game equivalent of snorting 50mg of coke off an expired credit card, running into the kitchen, grabbing a rusty meat cleaver, and going on a slice and dice bender down at the local Tesco. He can also attach a stick of fucking dynamite to the thing, making it explode on impact, meaning the enemies get cut and blown up at the same time. Death times two motherfuck strategy. As Krieg is very obviously a melee character, he has a knack for being close up and personal with his axe, or any type of melee weapon, but preferably the axe. He is also good with pretty much any type of weapon that isn't a sniper rifle, because fuck them in particular, I guess, right? His Hellborn build basically just means if something isn't on fire, you aren't doing it right. Pretty much the whole tree is basically more fire equals good, so it's worth investing in most of them if you want to fully utilize the flamey aspect of Krieg. The only one in the entire skill tree that I would personally skip out on is Hellfire Halitosis, which makes him breathe a really big fire cone. Whilst, don't get me wrong, breathing literal fire is fun and all, it does not scale very well and is just a waste of a skill point you could put somewhere else in my opinion. Pairing something like the Flame of the Firehawk Shield with something like, I don't know, uh, Miss Moxie's Heartbreaker or the Hellfire SMG in a Legendary Torch class mod makes for a very fun and extremely orange time. Honestly though, any gun with a lot of projectiles, a high status chance and that comes in fire element works pretty well with this build. Another extremely popular build is the Blood Splosion slash Bloodlust build. Guns like the Slagger, Peak Opener, and the Interfacer are great weapons for this. Paired with a shield like the Rough Rider and the Legendary Reaper class mod, you can't really go wrong with this bad boy. There's a reason Jolts stands by it so much. Now it's time for factoids about Krieg. They aren't fun this time though, because I heard saying the word... F-U-N? Around Krieg is like giving a small child a live grenade with a pin pole before heading into school. Shit won't end well. 
Unlike any other character, Krieg has a unique melee damage bonus. Krieg gains more melee damage per level than any other character, but up until level 12, Krieg actually does less damage than any other character at 81.6%. Well, every other character does 100%. But it's 208% at max level. A weapon's melee damage bonus overrides Krieg's unique modifier, so Krieg will do the same melee damage as the other characters when holding a bladed weapon. At level 44, Krieg's modifier amounts to an effective plus 50% bonus. From this point on, Krieg will do less damage with a plus 50% melee damage weapon than without one. At level 80, the modifier amounts to an effective 108% bonus, making it better than the Law's 100% bonus, meaning there's no reason to use the Law with the blade on it. However, the Rapier's 200% bonus will always increase melee damage, as the current level cap does not grant a higher effective bonus for Krieg. Krieg is one of the only Vault Hunters who employs suicidal tactics, including Silence the Voices, Light the Fuse, Redeem the Soul, Pull the Pin, Fuel the Rampage, and Salt the Wound. Many of Krieg's skills and dialogues are based on Psycho Bandit abilities, including exploding and throwing explosive, like Suicide Psychos, breathing fire, like Burning Psychos, and rushing opponents for melee, like, you know, pretty much every other Psycho. Get the fuck out of here, little nigga. Krieg's name in German means war. Krieg's bounty is 100 billion. No crimes are listed, and he is branded as Property of Hyperion. However, his quick change head, I Wanna Be Wanted, lists indecent exposure as his offence. Krieg has no lines while under the effects of Handsome Jack's voice modulator, though he does make the same stock grunts. Additionally, enemies will not react if Krieg activates Buzak's Rampage. Krieg often breaks the fourth wall with his quotes. Based on his quotes, Krieg seems concerned with several different women. His quotes involving she are highly inconsistent and cannot be linked. Krieg's Buzax is bandit made and has various visual upgrades depending on what skills Krieg has investments in. In Borderlands 2 and in a meat bicycle built for two, Krieg's Buzax shares the shiny red and blue colour scheme of a few bandit legendary guns like the Badaboom and the Madhouse. You know that like reddy, bluey, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is not the case in his character render nor in Borderlands 3. With the exception of spell grenade mods used during the Dragon's Keep DLC, Krieg doesn't have a single quote for when he throws a grenade. A comb can be seen in the back left pocket of Krieg's pants. While most of Krieg's customization heads depict his right eye being covered, some show him with two eyes visible. And finally, Krieg experiences less hang time or less jump time than other characters during a jump. This heaviness helps to prevent him from getting shoved around from frequent knockback effects in melee situations. Because of this, in the August 29th, 2013 update, Gearbox removed the challenges that are impossible to do with Krieg due to his heft, such as getting atop the Happy Pig Motel sign in Three Horns Valley. I love Krieg. I don't think there's a single person out there who dislikes him as a character, and if there is, uh, come here, come here, I, I, come here, come here, I only want to talk. Krieg is one of those few times where Gearbox just got it perfect. Everything about this creature of the damned with a heart full of gold is so alluring. That paired with his depressing backstory and horrible trauma this man has had to go through really makes him one of the single best characters in video game media in my opinion. And whether you agree with me or not, he will always have a place in my heart as the best of all time. Good job, Krieg. It's now time to move on to the middle child of the Borderlands games, and some of the most, if not the most, underrated characters in the whole series, with some amazing action skills, skill trees, and personalities to go along with it. Borderlands the pre-sequel. Coming only two years after Borderlands 2, it's safe to say that the pre-sequel had some very mixed fan reception at the time, and unfortunately it has left a permanent scar rotting away at the game. I mean, it did have to live up to Borderlands 2, which was a hard thing to do, and with being labelled Borderlands 2.5, it didn't really have the best start. There are legitimate issues with TPS, I feel like it and by consequence the characters got a lot more hate than they deserved, especially looking back in hindsight after Borderlands 3 was released. These new 4, and eventually 6, new Vault Hunters had took what made the last 6 playable Vault Hunters great and improved on them in a variety of ways, but who are these people that took the call to help Jack before he became a handsome dickhead? Athena. The Gladiator uses her kinetic aspis, a shield to block enemy attacks, and can return the damage collected by her shield by throwing it at an enemy. Wilhelm, the Enforcer. 
a mercenary with an addiction to cybernetic enhancements who can summon two drones to aid him in combat. Nisha, the Lawbringer, who can activate Showdown, which automatically locks onto enemy critical spots and grants her improved gun capabilities in almost every way. And finally, Claptrap, the mistake, only joking, is loaded with a malware package called VaultHunter.exe that fully restores health and constantly heals him. This allows Claptrap to assess the situation before choosing a sometimes appropriate subroutine for the task, which can spread its effects to nearby allies. Unfortunately, one of the subroutines is not shut the fuck up please.txt. I think I see a fatal flaw with the design. How did you know that stairs were my only weakness? Next to electrocution and explosions and gunfire, rust, corrosion, being kicked a lot, viruses, being called bad names, falling from great heights, drowning, adult onset diabetes. Will you shut the hell up? Further down the line, two more brave heroes would step up to the call of Hyperion. One looking very familiar too. Timothy Lawrence, aka Jack, the doppelganger. He is armed with a hologram projector that lets him summon an endless supply of digijacks to deal with his enemies. And Euralia Hamelock, the Baroness and sister of Sir Hamelock, carries a frost diadem gem that she can toss out to freeze her enemies, and also has the bonus ability of being better than everyone else. Because, you know, She's rich. With the help of these four, and eventually six, new Vault Hunters at Jack's side, they could finally figure out what the hell is going on with Dahl, why they are attacking Elpis, and find the hidden Vault of the Sentinel. Okay, we're going to start the pre-sequel characters off with the Hooded Rogue, the Atlas Hater, the girlfriend of the Aussie legend from Elpis, Athena. I live, I learn, I rule. Athena is the gladiator class playable in Borderlands the pre-sequel. She used to be a lance assassin, even claiming to be the top operative of the Crimson Lance and the leader of an Omega squad, but has since defected. Background. Not much is actually known about Athena's past, other than that she was trained to be an assassin since childhood along with many other girls her age by the Atlas Corporation. She and all the assassins trainee are later recruited into the Crimson Lance to do the dirty work of Atlas, and Athena being, well, Athena, Gradually got sick of Atlas's shit and decided to get the fuck out of Dodge. Involvement At some point during the Crimson Lancer's invasion of Pandora, Athena and her fellow assassins were sent to the planet to help clear out any obstacles. Though General Knox was initially against the idea, he later approved of the assassins after seeing their work at cleaning up T-Bone Junction. Athena, however, had a different objective while on Pandora, searching for her long-lost sister Jess. She mentions to Knox that she once found Jess, and both of them would leave Pandora. However, in an attempt to keep Athena in the core, the Crimson Lance tricked her by ordering a total annihilation on the village where Jess lived. Athena, in the midst of all the confusion, killed Jess by mistake. Realising what she had done, she turned on the Lance and got... Stabby. She was then later imprisoned but escaped, vowing vengeance on the Crimson Lance as well as the Atlas Corporation. Athena realises the goals of the Vault Hunters are aligned with her own and contacts them when they first enter T-Bone Junction. Her first errand sends the Vault Hunters to see Scooter for further instructions. We must speak immediately, but I'm afraid for my own security, and therefore you must jump through a hoop or two. Talk to the mechanic, he knows where to find me. And a word of caution. Don't touch him if you ever want to eat with your hands again. Scooter reveals that Athena is hiding in Moxie's red light, but upon arriving there, the Vault Hunters learn that Athena had been kidnapped by Mr. Shank, who plans to turn her over to the Crimson Lance for the bounty on her head. The rest of the DLC involves them destroying the Crimson Armory and killing General Knox. After helping the Vault Hunters take down Atlas, she travelled to Pandora as a hired gun. Desperate for money, she took a job as a Vault Hunter for a low-level Hyperion programmer by the name of Jack? Never heard of him. Seems nice enough though. Hopefully he doesn't try and take over the world and kill everyone. She then joined five other Vault Hunters, Nisha, Wilhelm, Claptrap, Timothy and Aurelia on a spaceship headed for Helios, Hyperion's moon base. After opening the vault on Elpis, Athena, disheartened by Jack's greed, throws away all the money Jack gave her for her service and decided to move to Hollow Point with Janie Springs. Low on money now, fucking duh, she reluctantly took another job from Handsome Jack before leaving again. Okay, 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 okay. So listen, yeah? I'm not saying you're dumb or anything, right? Like, I'm not. Like, I get it. It felt like blood money and it was all wrong and that. la di da di da But, why the fuck would you do that? Are you fucking dumb? I could have used that money to pay off my new car. After Handsome Jack's death, 
Athena was still living in Hollow Point with Janie, reportedly retired as a bounty hunter. However, she came out of retirement seemingly in a bid to capture and kill Fiona and Sasha. Later, it's revealed that she was actually hired by Felix to protect the sisters, and during this mission, she is captured by Brick and Mordecai, leading into the end seed from Borderlands 3 sequel. Lilith then questions her about her involvement with opening the Vault of the Sentinel and Handsome Jack's rise to power. After she finishes her story, Lilith realises there is only room for one bitchy mysterious woman aboard Sanctuary and orders her men to open fire. The Watcher then, from the beginning of the game, makes a sudden appearance and saves her yada 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 yada. We all know the Watcher by now. Is coming. Skills Athena must have had like a massive thing for Captain America growing up or something because she's basically a fucking way cooler version of the man in the questionably tight spandex. Kinetic Aspis is Athena's action skill. When this skill is activated, Athena raises her shield and is able to absorb incoming frontal damage for a short time. At the end of the duration, or by activating the skill again, Athena throws her shield, dealing base damage plus double the absorbed damage if an enemy is hit. I also love calling it the bonk machine and going BONK whenever I kill an enemy with it. <laughs> See, who said mass murder wasn't funny? Strategy Athena is very effective with melee attacks and prefers to be up close and personal with her enemies. She has no particular weapon type she strives for, but SMGs and shotguns are good picks. As long as whatever you use comes in shock and fire anyway. One of the most annoyingly named skill trees, the Serunic Storm Tree is great for shock and fire based builds. Milestrom is worth investing into, giving you stacks of the same name by either dealing fire or shock damage, which then increases the effectiveness of both elements. The more you invest into the Storm Tree, the more you become the, what I like to call, Burning Static build. Do not steal that, do not steal that name, seriously I'm watching you. Milestrom plus something like Stormweave, Smite, Elemental Barrage and Overload are a great choice. Pair those with a Raging Storm or Celestial Gladiator class mod for a shockingly good time. Eh? No? Okay, I'll leave. I know a lot of people recommend going down the Phalanx tree first, but it's mostly defensive until the final skill, which is awesome by the way. If you find yourself not needing the defense as much, I'd go down one of the other trees to speed up the killing. Obviously, I'm partial to Serenic myself since that's part of my build, but you know, it's whatever. It's more a gear dependent tree though, you'll constantly have to be on the lookout for shock or fire upgrades, though you'll be getting a killer shock laser sometime in the game soon. With Phalanx you can just get whatever strongest weapons you need without worrying about elements, and if you die a lot it'll help keep you alive too. No matter what tree though, don't be scared to pull out your Aspis whenever it's up. The cooldown's short and it's fun as fuck to use. Fun fact time. Fun fact time. What would? Athena evidently possesses formidable combat skills, as she has killed a very large number of bandits, including numerous badasses, in cramped close quarters at Moxie's red light, prior to ultimately being subdued and captured. Moxie likewise comments with regards to Athena that, That kitty has claws! The fact is explained again in Borderlands the pre-sequel by Lilith, when she noted how it took the two best soldiers, Brick and Mordecai, to capture her, although she had backup from Fiona and a giant man-eating plant that temporarily restrained Brick for a while. Opening the door to Athena's former prison cell in Lockdown Palace still triggers her introductory cutscene, even after completing the associated mission. Athena claims to have a very good memory, as evidenced by her ability to tell the story of how she worked with Handsome Jack in the pre-sequel many, many years before, as well as being able to recite the 17th thing Jack said to her in the story. You really remember all the stuff these people said to you, word for word? I have a good memory. What's the 17th thing Jack says in your story? She leads these jackasses, I think. First person to shoot her in the head gets a high five and a turbo mansion. A what? I totally don't remember if you're right or not, but still what? She, much like Axton, is bisexual, but is generally more fond of women. In Greek mythology, Athena was a goddess of strategy, war, and wisdom. And lastly, in the secret army of General Knox, shooting Athena will cause her to bleed, although this doesn't affect her as she's an allied NPC, this differs from most other allied NPCs who show sparks instead of blood when shot at, and in later games where bullets ignore NPCs entirely. Random fact. But that's what they are, innit? They're, 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 they're fun. Such an interesting character that was decided to be brought back, and I'm sure many people didn't even have a clue who Athena was until the pre-sequel, or fuck, maybe even Tales from the Borderlands came out. The same goes for me. I hadn't gone back to play Borderlands 1 at the point the TPS had originally released, and I didn't play the DLC for a few years after that still. As one of the characters that appears in a couple of Borderlands stories, she's definitely underrated as a character. Her tragic backstory, her constantly changing moral compasses, thinking she's with the good guys only for them to turn out to be 
horrible dickheads with bad intentions. It all rounds to an amazing Vault Hunter who is very unintentionally funny, especially when talking to someone with the opposite type of enthusiasm to her like Tiny Tina. Tell it again! Tell it again! The whole story? Right now? Yeah! Lilith is dealing with that Guardian thing and we're bored. But make it sound more difficult. And change the names of the chumps you killed. Um, okay. Athena! Athena! You're pretty. I am sorry, but that means nothing to me. Years of Atlas training conditioned me to not care about superficial things like beauty, attraction, love. Athena, you're real bad at taking compliments. I hope to see you again someday, Athena. But for now, enjoy retirement with Janie. Up next is the literal biggest threat the original Vault Hunters faced in their time. It's not Jack, it's not the writing staff of Gearbox, it's a man who fell in love with and later dedicated his entire being to becoming a cyborg. Someone who has an even weirder relationship with robots than Axton and Gage do, and a man who gave me the absolute mess of a pistol called the Logan's Gun when I really wanted a Rolling Thunder and I was only allowed to farm the boss for a legendary until he dropped one of the things in his loot pool and I was only allowed to use one gun at a time and of course I was using the Unkempt Tower at the time when I got it and- Hey! Shut the fuck up! Huh? Shut the fuck up! We've got fucking neighbours, bro! We've got neighbours, shut up, bro! It's Wilhelm. Anybody wanna pay me a quarter to kill that guy? Wilhelm is the Enforcer class playable in Borderlands the pre-sequel. He is from the planet Hera, becomes fully-fledged cyborg who serves Handsome Jack, and nearly killed the original Vault Hunters after the events of Borderlands 1. Background. As a child, Wilhelm had a mild case of bone waste that required him to get cybernetic implants at an early age, which would develop into a full-out addiction to cybernetics and a desire to become a full-on robot later on in his life. He became a mercenary with his aggressive tendencies and would go on to become the galaxy's most famous mercenary, having fought for every corporation and gaining a kill count equivalent to a small country, though his failure to protect either a president or an orphanage made it harder to get jobs in the inner world. At some point, he was hired by Jack as a Vault Hunter on Elpis for a few million dollars, helping him in the rise to power and eventually becoming his chief minion. Involvement After the series of the pre-sequel, Wilhelm is one of only three Vault Hunters who actually decide to stick with Jack, the other two being Nisha and Timothy. And to be fair, I don't think Timothy could like legally leave, but whatever. He became a very loyal soldier to Jack and took part in many raids of settlements during the Hyperion occupation of Pandora. Him and Jack both had a mutual agreement. Wilhelm does whatever Jack wants him to do, and he'll be paid in highest technological advancements the Hyperion could offer him. This was a win-win, and they continued their relationship for many years with little trouble. Wilhelm helped Hyperion take over the original Vault Hunter's base of operations, New Haven. They burnt it all to the ground, had almost killed Roland, Brick, and Mordecai, and had killed Lilith, as far as they were aware of. Wilhelm is the first major boss of Borderlands 2. He is mentioned multiple times by the Guardian Angel, with considerable trepidation, before he was fought at the end of the line. Though not mentioned in the game's final release, it is identified in cut content and voice lines of the game that Jack had actually poisoned Wilhelm. So, Wilhelm nearly killed your Vault Hunter friends a couple of years ago, and you just blow him away like any other grunt? Yeah, that's because I poisoned him before you guys fought. Worth it, though, to make you think I didn't want you to have that power core. But, uh, psst. Spoilers. This was to make sure that the new Vault Hunters could actually take him down and were able to grab the Hyperion power core. I mean, I knew Jack underestimated us, but fuck me. Poisoning your best and most loyal soldier after years of service is another level of dickheadedness. This is disputed as being the reason why all the OG Vault Hunters absolutely shit themselves when they find out Wilhelm is protecting the core. Even though Wilhelm's fight is as easy as a 3 out of 10 after 6 ales and a long night. After he's dealt with, Jack mourns his death for a solid like 2 seconds before playing the world's smallest violin and leaving to do literally anything else. Skills. Wilhelm has the ability to summon two Surveyor Drones, each with drastically different abilities. Saint, the defensive drone, is painted white and heals Wilhelm in combat and can be upgraded to enhance its medic-capable abilities. On the opposite end, Wolf, the red and black offensive drone with cute little teeth sign on the side of it, you see that? Serves to attack any enemies in Wilhelm's general direction, and much like Saint, can be upgraded to enhance attacks and add a variety of offensive-based abilities to its roster. Much like the devil and angel on the shoulder, the contrasting uses of these drones make them extremely efficient. I would not like to think of what Wilhelm gets up to with these things in private, but if they ever go to the workshop looking a little bit sticky, I won't ask twice. 
Strategy. Wilhelm doesn't have any preferred types of weapons, but is very effective with Malamon lasers and SMGs. Also, pretty much any weapon with the ability to hit fire easily and has a high fire rate. Wilhelm's Cyber Commando tree essentially turns him into a completely different class, allowing him to abuse his love for cybernetic enhancements fully. Some of my favourite cyborg -y skills are as follows. Power Fist, which turns one of his arms into a literal fucking super extendable punching arm, allowing him to knock back enemies like nothing else. And it's also a Nintendo reference, which has an extra splash of pizzazz. Shock Absorber, which turns him into a robot, white, American version of Usain Bolt, for only the loss of his actual physical legs. But I'm sure he doesn't mind. So now he can be like me after a coffee. Depressed but fast. And the final one is Vengeance Cannon, which welds a literal laser cannon onto his shoulder, allowing him to shoot that, plus his normal guns as well. Only whenever his shields are down though. I know Torg won't like it because it's a laser weapon and you know I don't want to upset Mr. Flexington, but come on, it's a fucking cannon strapped onto your hand. Pandora! Ring! You don't want to hear about that, Vault Hunter! You want to hear about loot and pecs and explosions! I'm Torg! And I'm here to ask you one question, and one question only. EXPLOSIONS! Pair these augments with the Shield of Ages and the Celestial Enforcer class mod, and you can become a one-man walking army of death, with questionable morals. Another route to go down is the drone-based build. Saint isn't as great as Wolf early on, but if you put the points into the Dreadnought tree to buff him up, he's very helpful. In Fight for Your Life mode, if you have Wolf and Saint summoned, Wolf's kills can revive you as well. This helps a lot with your survival, and Wolf has saved me more times than I'd like to admit. By investing in skills like Fire Support, Afterburner, Suppression, Venom Bolts, Laser Guided, and Zero Hour, you can really get a good mix of offensive and defensive capabilities from your drones, allowing you to dish out major punishment while also being able to relax and have a nice mojito at the same time. Now, it's time for the depressing facts. They're supposed to be fun, but I think Wilhelm is intolerant to enthusiasm, so he might start flaring up if I happen to mention any positive adjectives around him. In Borderlands 2, Wilhelm has no intro cutscene, as he is meant to be a surprise during the mission. Wilhelm is the German version of the name William. Wilhelm. 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 Investing in the skills of the Cyber Commando tree changes Wilhelm's voice, adding audible distortion to his voice the more upgrades are added. Systems upgrading! All systems are a go! Upgrade time! In Borderlands the pre-sequel, Wilhelm tends to reply to statements made to him with stern, to-the-point responses. He is known for stating a single no when asked a question he dislikes. Hey Wilhelm, you want to come to the moon and hunt a vault for me? No. I'll pay you a couple million dollars. Okay. And finally, Wilhelm's design in Borderlands 2 was simply just a larger, more customised engineer, with his design later being expanded upon to the one that we know and love today. Though not one of the most favourite characters in the franchise, he's very unique in his own ways, being literally the only character to have his voice completely change based upon which skill tree you go down. Whilst certain characters unlock extra voice lines, like Gage with Anarchy, no other character has had their voice lines change because of mutations they receive through the skill tree, and that's such a cool concept to me and I wish it could be done again in future. Even though Jack got you killed and forgot about you pretty much immediately, we sure won't Wilhelm. Rest in robotic little pieces, bro. Now it's time for a rootin', tootin'. This guy was chatting shit, so I had to mute him. Lover of Handsome Jack himself. It's Nisha. Time to dance, assholes. Nisha is a Lawbringer class in Borderlands, the pre-sequel. She has a knack for Jacob's revolvers, not sponsored, to bring her foes down and is not afraid of a good old showdown even if it leads to her untimely demise. Background. Nisha had a rough childhood, having to deal with an abusive mother who often yelled at her and tossed all sorts of things at her. She used this as a way to train her reflexes, eventually being able to catch everything her mother could throw at her. One day, Nisha's father got her a puppy, which she started to care for. The two of them were inseparable, until the dog was bitten by a frenzy crutch. First, the dog showed no strange signs, but during one night while Nisha was catching more of her mother's projectiles, one of them slipped off her hand and hit the dog. 
Its eyes went red, lips went blue, and it jumped on Nisha and bit her in the neck. Obviously, her mother just laughed. After getting patched up by her father, Nisha used a shovel to bash the dog's brains out. As Nisha grew, she began to develop an interest in killing bandits. Her tendency to kill political leaders who were also bandit leaders earned her a reputation as the bandit who kills bandits. Her actions eventually caught the attention of a man named Jack, who then recruited her to be a part of his personal team of vault hunters. Involvement After finishing her job, Nisha began a romantic relationship with Handsome Jack and became his significant other. Later on, Nisha assisted in the fall of New Haven and even managed to capture an imprisoned brick as well as killing his beloved puppy. At some point, Handsome Jack gave Nisha governing power over the town of Lynchwood, with her taking up the office of sheriff. She ruled Lynchwood with an iron fist, enforcing over 200 of her own laws, each of which is punishable by death. After the Vault Hunters arrive and start disrupting her control under the orders of a vengeful brick, she challenges them to a showdown at Hanoon in classic western style, and is defeated. <laughs> no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait! You know, I just noticed, with hindsight, if you face off against Nisha with Salvador, you're essentially going against yourself, but with pistols, and an 899 subscription of Aimbot from Aimlabs. Skills. Showdown is Nisha's action skill. This skill enables Nisha to automatically aim at enemies in front of her for a short time. Nisha, in this state, increases gun damage, fire rate, reload speed, accuracy, and bullet speed. Sniper rivals and rocket launchers do not receive the damage bonus, however. Yeah, she was defo the type of person to offer you a hacked account in one of those modded lobbies on Modern Warfare 3 back in the day, but like, as soon as you join, she just slaps a fucking JTAG on your account, fucks you off and resets all your stats. Defo never happened to me. I, I swear. Strategy. Nisha has a very special place in her heart for pistols, and specifically Jacob's revolvers. Not sponsored. You know, being a hoedown, showdown type of gal and all. But depending on what skill tree you decide to go down, she can be accurate with a plethora of weapon types. The fan favourite build that a lot of people play Nisha specifically is for is like a build I like to call the Law Zerka, which is essentially investing in the fan the hammer skill tree, reaching the bottom, slapping on one for each of you, and spamming the ever-loving shit out of the trigger till all your fingers fall off. It's basically like taking Salvador, making him use only pistols, and giving him the ability to hit anything and everything with a blindfold on and his arms tied behind his back. So yeah, it's pretty good. Using any Jacob's revolver like the Maggie, not sponsored, the Pepper Box, or even a Vladov pistol like the Anarchist can weld great results for Nisha. Though in my eyes, using anything other than a trusty Jacob's revolver, once again, not sponsored, is sacrilege in my opinion. But this time and this time only, I will allow it. Pairing them with a shield like Moxie's Slammer, a Precision Strike Ozkit and the Chronicle of Elpis class mod, and ham! You can fan that ham! Mer. Fun fact time again. Will it ever end? Her full name was mentioned in one of her Killing Multiple Enemies quotes, in which she says that her name is Mrs. Kadam if the person addressing her is nasty. The name's Nisha! Miss Kadam if you're nasty! This is also a reference to the Janet Jackson song, Nasty, specifically to the lyrics, No, my first name ain't baby, it's Janet, Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. Nisha is a Hindi name meaning night, while her last name, Kadam, is an Indian name for a tree. And finally, Nisha's cowgirl hat from Borderlands the pre-sequel appears in the fourth episode of Tales from the Borderlands Escape Plan Bravo, among various other objects in the trophy case located in Jack's office. Nisha's silhouette also can be seen in profile of mysterious Vault Hunter veteran in the fifth episode of Tales from the Borderlands, The Vault of the Traveller. Miss Kadam, what can I say about you that hasn't already been said about Captain Crunch cereal? You're probably bad for my health, but god damn you're too good to pass up on sometimes. Being a class summed up by five words, Big Iron on his hip, Nisha is a super unique character, not only in her Wild West style and lovable attitude, but also because she's probably the only actual, real, proper villain you play as. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, well, Wilhelm was bad too, and he sticked around with Jack after the pre-sequel and helped burn down New Haven too. But I mean like a real villain. Wilhelm, whilst he wasn't a good person by any stretch of the imagination, the work he did prior to his employment by Jack was a job. He had to protect people and kill people for money, simple as. And even after sticking around with Jack, he only did so because he had been offered probably the best cybernetic enhancements money could buy, and all for free? The incentivization was there. But Nisha? It seems like after the events of the pre-sequel, she just... 
wanted to stick around. She was clearly very fond of Jack and enjoyed all the evil things he got up to. And even Lynchwood. It was just simply a present that Jack got for her as a gift. You know, because she became his girlfriend. She never had that deal of working to gain anything from him. And even prior to meeting Jack, the entire reason she was on his radar in the first place was for killing bandits. Not as a job or anything like Wilhelm, just for the sheer enjoyment. Though forgettable at times, you'll always be one of the most evil characters we have had the pleasure of playing as. Badass, Nisha. Oh god, do I have to do this one? Please, please. Alright, alright, fine, fine. Now, we're moving on to a special, annoying, and very tragic character. Someone with charisma, wit, undying loyalty, and attendance to never shut his goddamn mouth. It's the most iconic character in the entire franchise. Claptrap. Stairs? No! I am a CL4PTP stupid, but my friends call me Claptrap. This Claptrap, who is the original you meet in Firestone, is the playable Fragtrap class in the pre-sequel. You are asked by the game repeatedly if you are definitely 100% sure you want to play as him, and God, I should have listened. Please! Please! No! Background. Claptrap is a general purpose robot manufactured by Hyperion. It has been programmed with an over-enthusiastic personality and brags frequently, yet also expresses severe loneliness and cowardice. They also feel pain, but in slow motion. Claptraps are universally hated in the Borderlands universe, being used, abused, and made fun of by most people without a shred of mercy or regret. Which is kind of ironic because in the real world, people absolutely seem to love Claptrap. Throughout the first Borderlands game in the pre-sequel, multiple Claptraps can be seen in herds scattered around Pandora, Helios, and Elpis. This later changes when Handsome Jack vows to destroy every last one if and when he gets into power, and after the voyage into Claptrap's mind becomes reality. One survives, however, and ironically becomes the reason that Handsome Jack ends up being defeated in the end. Involvement When the Vault Hunters leave the bus at the very beginning of Borderlands 1, they are met by a Claptrap, who introduces them to Dr. Zed. You may call me by my locally designated name. I'm over here stroking my dick, I got lotion on my- It later takes them to the Firestone Gate in the mission Claptrap Rescue, where it is damaged by bandits. The Guardian Angel then says to get it a repair kit and perform the first Claptrap Rescue. Get us new! I think. Am I Stroke my dick. Claptrap later hangs out as an alert system to offer notifications of available missions, both in Firestone and later at T-Bone Junction. Claptrap undergoes a radical shift in programming at some point after the opening of the first vault, and is transformed into interplanetary ninja assassin Claptrap, and must be defeated to once again bring peace and order to Pandora. That, and if Claptraps rule the world, even for a day, I fear the worst for Pandora and its populace. Sometime after its programming is restored at the end of Claptrap's new robot revolution, the Firestone Claptrap encounters Jack, and whilst opening a door for him, informs it of its time as an assassin, which inspires Jack to subsequently reprogram and upgrade him. The upgrade removes its ability to open doors, but adds a full range of combat programming, as well as a stair climbing wheel, turning it into the Frag Trap. <laughs> During the Claptrap DLC of the pre-sequel, the Vault Hunters, including Claptrap itself, mindfuckery at its finest, enter a simulation of Claptrap's mind, where they encounter Claptrap as Claptrap's consciousness, who interacts with them as they navigate its mind. At the end of the Claptrastic Voyage story, Jack eliminates the Claptrap product line, destroying all of them except for Fragtrap. Jack shoots it, rips off its stair climbing wheel, and dumps it with the other destroyed Claptraps in wind shear waste. The remains of the Frag Trap coding within Claptrap managed to keep it barely active until it was discovered by Sir Hammerlock, who repairs it, turning it back into an ordinary Claptrap. See, as much as Hammerlock claims to hate Claptrap, he deep down, he loves him. He definitely does. Following Hyperion's takeover of Pandora and the deactivation of every other Claptrap unit at the hands of Handsome Jack, Claptrap, the last active robot of its product line, wished to exact revenge upon Jack. But without its combat capabilities, and without a way to climb stairs, it was unable to do so. Sometime before the new Vault Hunter's arrival, it was held captive by Captain Flint and tortured for his amusement. Claptrap escaped by staging a mutiny on the Soaring Dragon before the Southern Shelf Flash Freeze. Which explains why his men are currently beating the crap out of him, right guys? 
He manages to accidentally do one of the most important things in the entire Borderlands franchise by finding the new Vault Hunters from the train wreckage outside its place in Windshear Waste, accompanying them and calling them its minions. They fought their way through Southern Shelf, killing Flint and his men before stealing a boat and sailing for Three Horns Divide. In Sanctuary, Claptrap settles in a messy area away from the town centre, where he gives several optional missions. Oh yeah, he also has, like, the best plan for a party. J listen up. Roland later requests a software upgrade for Claptrap so he can deactivate the competitor deterrence field surrounding the bunker. This is obtained from Bloodwing at the end of the mission Wildlife Preservation. At the start of the mission where angels fear to tread, the Vault Hunters have the hardest task on earth of convincing Claptrap to help, taking multiple attempts and heavy bartering skills from the Vault Hunters to do so. Seriously, look how hard it was! Minion! Let's go to Thousand Cuts! Any questions? Yeah. Why ain't I going? I gotta pay Hyperion back for- Fuck up you nasty bitch! Nobody gives a shit! Can you shut the fuck up? Boy, if you don't- Shut your s- They later find him waiting in Thousand Cuts, spraying a graffiti on the wall. He deactivates the barrier, allowing the Vault Hunters to proceed while he retreats in cowardice, like usual. In the final story mission, Claptrap helps the Vault Hunters gain access to Hero's Pass. He hacks the door while the Vault Hunters defeat the loaders sent after them. Claptrap was ready to aid further in the assault on Hero's Pass, but is confronted by his main arch enemy of all time. Stairs? With no other way up, Claptrap stays to cry while cloaked. Sometime after Handsome Jack's defeat, Claptrap decides to go on a vacation by stowing himself on the HSS Terminus. However, the ship crashes on the primitive continent of Agrius when Claptrap disengages the ship's autopilot. When the Vault Hunters first encounter Claptrap on Agrius, he's being worshipped by savages due to his Hyperion manufacture. However, Claptrap accidentally angers the savages when he insults Handsome Jack and needs to be saved. I know I'm your best friend, but sometimes I just need to sit back, relax, and get worshipped by a bunch of dudes who look kinda like that douchebag you killed. The fuck you say to me, you little shit! What? I'm just saying that if you could measure a human being in douchelocities, Handsome Jack would be off the scale! <laughs> how are you how are you not in fucking school? After defending Claptrap from the savages, he informs the Vault Hunters that Professor Nakayama is trying to clone Handsome Jack and orders the Vault Hunters to destroy Jack's DNA samples. When Brick, Lilith, and Mordecai were playing Bunkers and Badasses with Tiny Tina, Claptrap appeared in the game as a Grand Wizard, assisting in reaching the Handsome Sorcerer. He also gives them several quests in order to make it more powerful, such as forging a beard and making a powerful wand. After the four of them finish their game, Claptrap joins them in the Vault Hunters at Roland's memorial statue. After Tina says her farewell to Roland, Claptrap ruins it. I love you guys! During the events of the Vault of the Traveller, if the player has enough money, they can hire the Mystery Vault Hunter in the fight against the Traveller, which happens to be Claptrap. Claptrap is notably more snarkier than usual during the events of the episode and is a general nuisance throughout the battle. However, it does ultimately assist in the fight if chosen. When inside Gortus, Claptrap's attack will consist of a clumsy rapid fire missile strike. <laughs> Sometime after the defeat of the Traveller, Sanctuary is attacked, and when Lilith evacuates the Flying City, Claptrap is transported to the Dahl Abandon. There, he learns of some crystals in a nearby mine and decides to dub them Becco Wafers, tasking the Vault Hunters to gather them for him. Believing that Becco Wafers will make it rich, Claptrap tells Lilith that it doesn't need her or the Crimson Raiders anymore and is going to strike out on his own, to which Lilith reacts with disinterest. Take your Crimson Raiders and shove it! <laughs> As soon as the Becker wafers are delivered to him, Claptrap suddenly realises they are worthless and begs Lilith to allow him back into the Raiders, to which she agrees with the same disinterest as when he left the Raiders in the first place. Please, please let me have my old job back! I'm sorry I abandoned you in your time of need! Okay. Claptrap then leaves the dolls abandoned and takes up residence in the back burner with the other Crimson Raiders, still carrying the Becco wafers. A few years later, Claptrap is introduced to a new set of four Vault Hunters and has something seemingly wrong with his voice. You must be the new recruit. 
I am a CL4PTP steward bot. Don't worry though, I'm sure there's a super simple explanation to that, which definitely didn't involve assault and constant back and forth on Twitter. Uh, I mean... <laughs> Claptrap sounds exactly the same. What are you talking about? After he helps them reach Lilith, he becomes a part of Sanctuary 3, helping out a few times and doing the complete opposite a few more times. <coughs> he then proceeds to hand out missions and take up the completely mentally stable task of building a woman Claptrap that ironically rejects him. Bro has negative riz. RIP his social skills. Skills. Claptrap's action skill analyzes the combat situation and chooses the most suitable action package, providing him with bonuses in an appropriate fighting style for a short period of time. Some bonuses may also affect nearby teammates. Activating the skill fills Claptrap's health and instantly provides health regeneration. In addition to his action skill, and unlike any other playable character in Borderlands' history, Claptrap can unlock and use action packages, which include Torg Fiesta, Pirate Ship Mode, Clap in the Box, Gun Wizard, one Shot Wonder and Laser Inferno, most of them being nods to the other Vault Hunters in the Borderlands franchise. Strategy. Don't play him. Just don't. Just don't do it, please. Just just g give yourself a day off and just don't subject yourself to the torture that is playing Cla Claptrap can be super inconsistent at times due to his skill essentially being a roll of a dice. He is, however, one of the most underrated playable characters in the game. He has a fondness for TD or SMGs, but it is definitely not necessary to kick ass with any builds for Clappy. Most simply assume that Claptrap would suck and so often choose other characters to play. However, this silly looking goofball can be an exceptional Vault Hunter. One of his better builds is known as the Booming Frag Trap, coined by Midnight Wabbit. This Claptrap build will dramatically increase the output of your explosive damage and help you to eliminate enemies effectively. This is not only great for fighting opponents, but also helps you to deal with heavy damage in the game, just in case you suck or somehow have a gravitational pull but only for hot lead. It uses a lot of the Boom Trap skill tree, which is all about explosive damage, and apart from that, this build also focuses on a few great skills from the I love you guys tree increasing your survivability. It involves grabbing the final skill in the boom trap tree, living on the edge, increasing your fire rate and reload speed by up to 100%, and unlocking the pirate ship action package. And other skills such as second wind by Tedior, load and explode, myanical laughter, it's a trap card and you're going to love me, it's also great to have. Pair these with a bomber Oz kit, Chronica of Elpis class mod and the IVF, which is baby maker, and you're looking nice and splody. Okay, now let's run through these fun facts quickly so I can move swiftly on from this hell and cover the DLC characters already. Claptrap is a word synonymous with drivel or babble, which is intentionally referenced in game, as all Claptraps ramble on and are rarely not speaking. I can't believe this sh Really, Mom, burn you with cigarettes as a child? Seriously, I, this, this is... I, I'm sure I, you've I, all heard that our game has, like... A million bazillion what people guns. probably don't know is that we generate. I mean, there must be 20 different types of. In the German version of Borderlands, the initial claptrap introduces itself as a CLP4PTP, even though the subtitles read CL4PTP. Claptrap expresses excruciating pain when his eyes ripped out in Borderlands 2 by Knuckle Dragger, but later when he's beaten by bandits, he states that he cannot feel pain. The Claptrap unit featured at the start of Borderlands the pre-sequel, however, states that robots feel pain, but in slow motion with great intensity. In Borderlands 2, Claptrap breaks the fourth wall in the mission Claptrap Secret Stash when he addresses the players directly and advises them that they can use the stash to twink their characters. Claptrap's tendency to become a nuisance to everyone resulted in him becoming one of the most hated characters in the entire Borderlands franchise in-game, which is once again super ironic considering the fanfare he receives outside of the game. And finally, Claptrap has appeared in the most Borderlands media out of every character, from the promotional material for Borderlands 1, to being a playable character in the pre-sequel, to having his own DLC in his mind, to even fucking Pokenite 2, a game which isn't even Borderlands. He's the character you see first at the start of every single Borderlands game, and has pretty much been in every piece of Borderlands media you can think of. Even the new Tales from the Borderlands has him as a Vaultlander figure. Everyone knows 
Claptrap. Similar to the Psycho from all the game's boxes, he is lathered around all the advertisements and he is the face of the franchise. While obviously it's super sad not to have David Eddings voicing Claptrap anymore, which honestly spoils him for me in the newer games, you can't help but respect the absolute nail that was hit on the head with the creation of this guy. See, even when I made that video about Handsome Jack appearing in a lot of the Borderlands media, you wouldn't see anyone complaining about Claptrap appearing in literally everything. And there's a reason for that. Whether you dislike the new voice actor or not, Claptrap will always have a place in this franchise. I was proud to be your minion Clappy and don't you ever forget that. Now we're moving straight on to the DLC characters that were introduced in the pre-sequel. The second batch of new Vault Hunters added to the franchise and so far the last ever DLC Vault Hunters in Borderlands history. Let's talk about them. First off is the man who had his life changed forever. The man who would be Jack. The dude who really needed the fucking money. It's Timothy Lawrence, the doppelganger. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll something, something, stars. Timothy Lawrence, formerly known as Jack, is a lookalike body double of Handsome Jack, representing the doppelganger class in Borderlands, the pre-sequel. He was first revealed at PAX Prime 2014, and is the third DLC character introduced in Borderlands history. Background. According to multiple echo logs found throughout the pre-sequel, Jack's real name is Timothy Lawrence. He was elected to undergo the major reconstructive surgery performed by Dr. Orton to pay off his student loans. Most same thing done to pay off crippling student debt. It is unknown what planet Timothy originated from and little to nothing is known about him before he signed up to become the doppelganger of Jack, not even what he looked like. There are a few noticeable things that are mentioned about him however, but you'll hear them later on. The theory I have surrounding that whole not knowing about his past is that Jack wanted to get rid of any traces of Timothy's past life, making it super difficult for anyone to find out anything substantial about him, which explains why so little is known about him as a person. Involvement. Timothy, now being known by the name of Jack, was recruited by the real Jack as part of a doppelganger experiment, along with five of the Vault Hunters, helps in finding a lost vault on Elpis. After the event of the pre-sequel, Timothy was placed on Handsome Jack's newly opened casino as a sort of distraction for customers, to add authenticity, and for anyone who wanted to kill Jack to take it out on him and the other doppelgangers within the facility. After Handsome Jack's death, the whole place turns to absolute shit and people start going rampant, blaming it on all of Jack's lookalikes and killing all of them. All but one. While looting the Handsome Jack pot, the new Vault Hunters hear a cry for help. Pretty Boy is sending loaders after someone in a makeshift hideout, and after defeating Pretty Boy's loaders, it is revealed that Timothy Lawrence is trapped in the casino and has been since the death of Handsome Jack. Okay, what about this guy? Ask yourself, why has he got his hat pulled down like that? He's fuck ugly. Or he doesn't want you to see his face. Because he's fuck ugly. His mask is cracked and his right hand has been grafted with a Hyperion brand cybernetic authorized access key dubbed the Winning Hand. Get it? Because it's because there's a casino. And you, and you win money, it's good, yeah. After finding out that Timothy is also trying to get into Jack's tower, the Vault Hunters team up with him upon Moxie's approval, who still seems to openly distrust him. Because Timothy's winning hand grants him full access to every facility in the casino, Pretty Boy kidnaps him and the Vault Hunters must rescue him. After destroying Pretty Boy's robot suit, the casino activates the screw everyone I'm rich protocol, which starts piloting the casino into a black hole. At first, Timothy tells the Vault Hunter to simply escape. However, Moxie refuses to abandon him and the Vault Hunters agree. Since he is still stuck, Timothy cuts off his cybernetic hand using his laser prison cage and gives it to the Vault Hunters to override the protocol. After averting the casino's destruction, he collapses. In the ending of the DLC, Timothy finally asks Moxie why she agreed to the date that she had with Jack, a detail he brought up a few times. He did so disguised as Jack, so he was confused why she agreed to have a dinner date with Jack even when he was the worst. Moxie admits to having known it was never Jack she met up with, it was Timothy, otherwise she definitely wouldn't have shown up, something that makes him really happy to learn. Get in there, laddie. <laughs> Skills. Jack the Doppelganger's action skill summons two Digi Jacks to fight for him, who constantly lose health and are continuously resurrected for its duration. They battle using wrist mounted lasers, punch and kick enemies who come too close, and can serve as a distraction against foes. The Digi Jacks can be outfitted with modifications via the skill trees, such as a shotgun laser or even being spawned as badasses. Also, more Jack equal better Jack. A bonus points if you're near Jack when spawning them in. Jackception, baby! Strategy. 
Jack can pretty much use any type and any brand of weapon. He's pretty versatile and even has a skill called Sponsored By, which adds various effects depending on the brand you are currently using, so don't be scared to switch him up a bit. The Ultimate Destruction build by Admiral Baru is an incredibly effective build for good old Timmy. It involves investing heavily into the greater good and enterprise skill trees and reaching skills at the bottom. One of them was previously mentioned, sponsored by, and the other one is called Leadership, which counts a Digijack death as an enemy kill, which can cause second wins. Super good and definitely one that you can want to pick up. Pairing that type of skill tree with a CEO of all CEOs class mod and an Eddie Oz kit makes for a really good build for the doppelganger overall. If you want to find a more in-detail version of that specific build by Baru, you can easily find it on YouTube. The advantage of Digijax is the distraction capability that like summons an Elder Ring. Even if they are useless damage-wise, you feel a hell of a lot less alone when fighting bosses. And sometimes we all need that little bit of comfiness in our lives, admit it. Oh yeah, and bosses will also just beam the fuck out of them instead of you, which, you know, also helps. Now it's time for some handsome facts. Oh my fucking god, it's ended. They aren't fun facts this time. Wait, what do you mean look at the text on the script? Oh god damn it. Timothy Lawrence suffers from acrophobia, better known as an abnormal fear of heights. Uh, this might be a problem because I, I got a thing with heights and uh, <laughs> oh god. In the pre-sequel, he is legally forbidden to mention his real name after his surgical change, as when asked by Roland, he only says it rhymes with Jimothy, stating there is a bomb in his face that will detonate if he says his real name. By the time of Borderlands 3, he is able to use his previous alias, though the bomb will explode if he ever leaves the casino he was put on. He used to have freckles before becoming Jack's body double, and he cares for his mother, but she doesn't return the statement. During the pre-sequel, he also says that he'd much rather be with his mother than doing whatever he's doing right now. To become Jack's body double, Timothy's death was also faked. His mother laughed when she found out, but Timothy tries to tell himself that she was actually crying on the inside. Yeah, keep coping, lad. Pretty Boy refers to Timothy as Timo. Timothy was injected with some of Handsome Jack's DNA, causing him to compulsively act like Jack sometimes. Timothy has been trapped in the casino for seven years. Timothy has acted in movies as Handsome Jack under the moniker Timothy Doppelman. It is implied that they are pornographic films and Jack forced him to participate. After Handsome Jack was scarred in a vault on Elpis, he branded all his doppelgangers to match his current appearance. As a result, Timothy resents Lilith for scarring Handsome Jack. And finally, Timothy is bisexual and he is seen to have a crush on Moxie and has also slept with Trent, a man in the Handsome Jackpot casino. The idea behind creating doppelgangers for Jack in Borderlands was such a great idea and after seeing and killing one in Borderlands 2, it got my mind spinning with how we could potentially play as Jack in a future game and I was partially right. Whilst Timothy is obviously a different person to Jack, it's an amazing concept that I was super indulged with. Playing Jack in a Borderlands game? What? Whilst he didn't need to come back for Borderlands 3, I'm glad he managed to become more involved in the story and have his character developed. You may look like Jack and act like him sometimes, but you are definitely your own man now, Timothy. Lastly, for all characters in the pre-sequel, we've got a super in-your-face, uptight, money-loving relative of Sir Hammy the Lock. It's Euralia the Baroness. I may be wealthy, but that does not mean I am not what you might call a boss-ass bitch. Lady Euralia Hammerlock is the playable Baroness class character in Borderlands the pre-sequel and the secondary antagonist of Borderlands 3. She is also, famously, the sister of Sir Hammerlock. Sibling rivalry is not as fun as you think. Background. The heiress of the Hammerlock family fortune, Euralia is the sister of Sir Alastair Hammerlock, with whom she shares a strained relationship due to her miserable treatment of him. An extremely wealthy socialite, she has taken up the hobby of hunting, travelling the galaxy to seek dangerous creatures to kill, as well as making her brother's life even more miserable. Her travels eventually brought her to Elpis, where she wound up with a group of vault hunters hired by Jack. Involvement According to Gage's dialogue in the Hollow Dome Onslaught DLC, Euralia was found on Epitaur by Gage and Axton, who were under orders from Lilith to find the vault on the planet. They managed to find Euralia under the additional order to kill her for involvement with Hyperion, but before the order was carried out, Lilith ordered them to not kill Euralia and bring her to Pandora, after Athena's execution was stopped by the Watcher, who warned them that war was approaching. 
fucking it, apparently not. During the events of Borderlands 3, Euralia has taken over the Jacobs Corporation with the help of Tyrene and Troy Calypso. They killed Montgomery Jacobs and she became the corporation's CEO. She also bribed Clay's ally, Archimedes, with two planets around Eden 7 and enough funds to build a water slide between them. According to Clay himself, Euralia also attempted to bribe him, but this failed as Clay refused to betray Monty Jacobs. When the Vault Hunters show up on Eden 6 to reclaim the Eden 6 Vault Key, Euralia really offers them a huge sum of money to leave the planet. Fuck it, you had me at offers. Wait, what do you mean we didn't leave? Wainwright, Jacobs and Hamelock recognise this as a trap, which they seize as an opportunity to search for clues. It is later revealed that Euralia was never in Jacob's estate at all, and she made a deal with Troy Calypso that they could kill the Vault Hunters. However, Troy is shot and led on a diversion by Wainwright, ruining the plan while the Vault Hunters managed to obtain information left by Montgomery before his death. Fill your hands, you zealot scum! Huh? <laughs> During the assault on Eden 6's vault, Sir Hamelock and Wainwright are successful in solving the puzzles to find the key fragment, but Aurelia stops them before they can get away. Hamelock attempts to reason with her, but she shoots both of them before Wainwright can fire, freezing them both and fights the Vault Hunters, but is ultimately killed. After being defrosted, Sir Hamelock thanks the Vault Hunters for giving her a chance at least. Such a tragedy she was killed off in Borderlands 3. Eruption Fang puts it best when he said that she probably had the most preventable death in the game. And honestly, I always forget what her whole section even adds to the story in the first place. You could completely remove it and add someone else instead, and it would pretty much be the exact same. Skills. Euralia's action skill is called Cold as Ice, which lets her throw out a Frost Diadem Shard that seeks out enemies and attaches to them, dealing constant damage. If that target dies, the Shard will move on to a new enemy, and so on and so forth. It's also a skill that is fundamentally tied to her personality, as she often passes very snarky remarks around and doesn't care what people think of her. You go, queen, and all that shit. Strategy. I think Mr. Freeze, aka Arnold Schwarzenegger, aka Arnie, aka the one line legend, can sum up how you play as her. Freeze well! Stay cool! Can you be cold, Batman? Chill! Allow me to break the ice. Everything. Freezes. Her gimmick is that she really likes ice! She is very fond of sniper rifles, having a variety of skills that have greater effectiveness if paired with them, and only a few that are straight up buffs to sniper rifles, like Only the Best and Warning Shot. Euralia is extremely well suited to the old glass cannon role. Cold money and contractual aristocracy also enhance her ice ability and allow Euralia to control servants that protect her in combat. She is pretty unique in terms of gameplay, if you ask me, offering a switch up style from the typical Vault Hunter shooty shooty guns blazing ask questions later type of playstyle, and apparently that's the only strat the LA police can remember. The best builds do not put a single point in contractual aristocracy. The main reason is because the skill tree depends so much on the servant mechanic and likely does not directly boost your alias damage. To start off with a build, you can go down the avalanche in cold money skill tree. Both Bitter Reposit and Winter's Veil have the same mechanic, so you only need one point for each of the skills. The full upgrade does not deal significant damage and should be spent on other skills. Aside from that, the remaining skills for Cold Money sync pretty well together. Pair this build with a good sniper rifle like the School Master or the Long Nail, Big Game Hunter, Class Mod and Precision Strike Oz Kit, and you'll be able to hit enemies so far away, people will think you're Russian Badger in 2013 with a 40x scope on Rogue Transmission. If you get that reference, by the way, you're an absolute G. Fun facts now. I would try to make them sound engaging to you, but I'm so much better than you anyway, so why even try? When created as a new character, Euralia will start with $37,000, a purple quality Calipine sniper rifle, and a purple rarity Leverage pistol to reflect her wealth. She is, so far, the only character to start with such high level gear in any Borderlands game. Along with Nisha and Wilhelm, Euralia is the third playable character that goes from being a protagonist to an antagonist. And finally, the last fun fact of the pre-sequel, I'm gonna miss him. In one of her idle quotes, Euralia says that her mother sold the family business. It is unknown what the business was, but there are mentions of subjugating workers and mining operations. This suggests that the Hamlock family may have had ties to the Dahl Corporation and their involvement on Pandora. The Baroness became such a tragic death for me in Borderlands 3. Much like how people felt in The Last of Us Part 2 when they had to fight Ellie as Abby and just wanted to watch Ellie beat the shit out of Abby because they don't like her, 
but we're forced to anyway because you need to win as the protagonist to advance the story. I really didn't want to fight Euralia, and I never once felt happy or satisfied with her boss fight or killing her in Borderlands 3. Obviously, that's just my opinion, though. If you hated her in the game, fair enough. Even though you're gone now, you definitely offered us a great, engaging, and unique playstyle in Borderlands, the pre-sequel, and we're a great DLC character to end them all on. Rest in icy little pieces, Euralia. Bor. De. Lens. 3. Borderlands 3. Offering the most amount of variation within the skill trees, the new four of Alt Hunters introduced in Borderlands 3 blow everything that came before them out of the water. Whether that's the amount of skills they can use, what they can add to their skills later down the line, customization of physical appearances, the addition of augments, and fuck, even a completely new skill tree path added later down the line. Borderlands 3 really switched up the formula from previous three games, and completely overhauled each character. All four of these new characters went to Pandora to find vaults, but all for different reasons but soon their paths would converge, leading them to a treasure greater than themselves. Amara, the Siren, who travelled to Pandora, being drawn to it. Her Siren powers manifest as spectral arms, being able to manipulate the battlefield to her will. Flak, the Beastmaster, an index unit that gains self-awareness and a lust for murder. He has a number of pets that are always on hand to help rip his enemies to shreds. Mose, the Gunner, an ex Vladov soldier who survived a suicide mission. She can summon an iron bear, a Vladov mech suit, allowing her to become encased in a metal box of death. And finally, Zane, the operative. He has a multitude of gadgets and gizmos at his disposal to help him in the front lines, such as digi-clones and a deployable barrier that blocks incoming projectiles. Classes function differently in this game, as each character has an action skill per skill tree, and the ability to augment these action skills by investing more skill points into the respective skill trees. This is alongside that each class has additional perks tied to them, like foregoing grenades for an extra action skill, for example. The fact that Borderlands 3 only has four Vault Hunters is disappointing to a lot of people. However, these extra two vault hunters that would usually be added were replaced with an extra skill tree path for each character, adding even more variation to the characters. Whether you disagree with it or not, it adds a lot more customization to the game and switches up the formula a bit. This added to the fact that much like the pre-sequel, the characters actually have a lot of voice lines. This makes them a lot more relatable and can add a lot of variety to the game when replaying as a different character. It's always nice to know what they are feeling at any specific moment, and unlike Borderlands 2, leads to a lot more feelings of actually playing characters that respond to what's going on rather than just simply doing everything everyone says without voicing so much as a grunt. Let's jump straight into them. First up is a woman with incredible powers. Someone drawn to Pandora. A siren with immense variations to her power. Like, seriously bitch, pick one. One of only six. It's Amara. Amara. I'm definitely on the list, probably at the top. Amara is the playable Siren class in Borderlands 3. Born and raised on Partali as a vigilante, she earned the name the Tiger of Partali, or the Tiger, due to her affiliation with being a Siren and showing her people the mysterious powers she possessed. Background. A crime-fighting hero born in the abysmal slums of Partali, Amara is most at home on the battlefield or in a brawl. She quickly became a hero when she was young, once showing off by punching holes in a concrete truck. Damn, go got a power, bro. Never content to stand idly by, people celebrated when she used her siren abilities the first time she fought a bully, and since then, she's been using her powers to smash oppressors and dismantle her foes. While in her phase trance, she channels her siren energy to form powerful arms that can shoot blasts of force or crush enemies in their grip. Brash, aggressive, and self-assured, Amara doesn't let anything stand in her way, though has been torn between seeking justice and building her personal legend since her early vigilante days. Involvement Being one of four new Vault Hunters recruited to the Crimson Raiders, she helps Lilith and the rest of Sanctuary fan the vaults all across the galaxy, open them up, and defeat Tyrene and Troy Calypso at the end of the game. Later on, she, along with the rest of the Vault Hunters, blow up a casino, marry two gay dudes, go yippee yee how for a few hours, and then enter the mind of a literal psycho. So, you know normal things. She continues to help the Crimson Raiders with any problems that they may have, and until the foreseeable future, is very happy with the position she currently has within the Crimson Raiders. Skills Amara's action skills off Phase Cast, Phase Grasp, and Phase Slam. She gains additional action skills further down her skill trees, some of which completely alter their base function from the default three. She has the largest variety of action skills as a result. Amara is able to equip one elemental augment, which alters her action skills element, with the default being Shock, and an action skill augment that grants additional abilities to her equipped action skill. The action skills that she has are Phase Grasp, 
where Amara summons a giant fist that bursts from the ground and locks the targeted enemy in place for a few seconds. Some enemies are immune to being grasped, however, and just take instant damage instead. This is essentially just Maya's phase lock, but from Wish, and it takes heavy inspiration from it, in both appearance and use. Phase Cast where Amara sends forward an astral projection of herself, dealing damage to everything in its path. Phase Slam, where Amara leaps into the air and slams the ground, dealing damage to all nearby enemies and knocking them upwards. Editing Lewis here, I forgot to add Phase Flare, the fourth action skill for Amara unlocked later down the line in the DLCs. This is where Amara summons an orb of elemental energy that deals constant elemental damage to nearby enemies. Don't worry if you don't have this one, as as I said, it's part of the DLCs. The original three that I mentioned before editing are the ones that every single person will get, and this one is get later down if you pay a little extra. Who the fuck told you about grabbing so many siren powers, huh? Why are you so special? Put them back, put them back. But nah, seriously, why is it never explained why Amara is so stupidly overpowered compared to like literally every other siren that isn't Tyrene? Like it went from Lilith being like, go invisible, walk fast and sometimes explode to literal world manipulation, throwing bitches round and slamming the ground with loads of hands. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Like what? Maybe every siren that's born progressively gets more powerful or something, but I doubt it. Nereid seemed pretty good to me. Strategy. With an Amara build, as with the other Borderlands 3 characters, there's a lot of scope for customization, with each of her skill trees offering you different things. Mystical Assault focuses on maintaining consistent high damage throughout a fight. Amara builds that use this tree often rely on building stacks of rush to further augment her action skill and gun damage. Fist of the Element is all about status effects and elemental damage. Amara builds focusing on this will have great crowd control and elemental strength. Brawl is for punching things really hard. Thing go... Rick would be proud. Close range prowess and very high melee damage are the benefits of upgrading this skill tree. The phase cast slash mystical assault centric Amara build is designed to strike a balance between gun, elemental and action skill damage. Many Amara players will prefer to beat the shit out of their enemies, but this build in particular provides a level of versatility that allows you to play at whatever range you want with whatever guns you want. Pair this with a good legendary class mod that suits your specific needs, the Revolter Shield and the Pearl of Ineffable Knowledge, of course, and you will shred through bosses and most tough enemies with ease. Like a hot knife through warm butter. First fun facts of Borderlands 3, let's go! It's not always about the fun facts, spoiler man. It's about the miss, baby, gotta get them. Amara's abilities and traits are influenced by South Asian culture. Whilst active, her arms perform symbolic gestures. During Going Rogue, Amara states she is fond of the colour gold, which is the symbol of the Hindu goddess Lakshmi and considered highly auspicious. Amara responds with the phrase Nai Bay during Raiders of the Lost Rock, which translates to no brother in the Bengali language. Amara's arms and tattoos will actually change colour depending on the element of her action skill, orange for Soulfire and green for Blight Tiger. Amara's siren tattoos will grow for every 10 levels she gains up until level 50, where her tattoos that originally covered only her left arm will now cover both arms. According to her own dialogue in the mission Pandora's Next Top Mouthpiece, Amara's favourite thing about Tyrene Calypso are her tattoos, which she thinks are <coughs> kinda hot. How dare you compliment Tyrene Calypso? It She's is fucking minging. According to her dialogue in the mission Sisterly Love, Amaro has siblings. According to various articles, Amaro. Amaro? Are you fucking stupid? According to various articles, Amaro is also in her late 20s. I meant to keep that in, by the way. She has loyalties to other sirens and greets them well. She was also married at one point, but chasing fame was her real love, so she keeps her romantic options open. So you're telling me there's a chance. She likes people who want her autograph and dislikes those who don't, defending the poor and undeserved, confrontations and punching things. Brick would have a conversation with this bitch. And finally, she dislikes people who say no to her and has no time for politics or nation building. Amara was the only siren that I didn't particularly get drawn into when I started Borderlands 3, and whilst I loved Maya and Lilith, seriously, you know how much I love Maya, Amara kind of seemed a bit bland and flat when I first saw her in the reveal trailer. Well, boy, was I wrong. Amara offers a fuck ton of versatile playstyles and can literally make the whole area around her cower in fear as she manipulates and tears through reality. She is essentially if you mixed Maya and Brick together in one congealed mess. And knowing Brick himself, he loves playing Maya in Bunkers and Badasses as she is the prettiest. 
so I'm sure he would not oppose this amalgamation of awesomeness that is Amara. Whilst I still don't particularly understand how the Borderlands 3 plot makes a lot of sense whilst playing as her, seeing as how Tyrion and Troy literally leech sirens and they don't lay so much as a finger on Amara, let alone try and steal her powers, I will always enjoy playing as her. I look forward to seeing you soon in Borderlands 4, Amara. Now, we're moving on to a robot who has a thing for mammals, and not the opposite like loads of these characters in the Borderlands franchise seemingly do. Someone who lives for the hunt, and is always waiting for the next opponent to wander into his crosshairs. The Beastmaster, Flack. Flack, and I am prepared to party down. Or up. I can party in any given direction. Flack is a playable Beastmaster class in Borderlands 3. He was formerly known as an Index unit that one day gained self-awareness and decided that killing things was just his purpose now evidently. He does not wander alone however, having a fondness for animals that he cares for. In return, these creatures aid in the heat of battle, making sure that all is going well. Also, it's always nice to have emotional support animals, sometimes let's be honest. We, we have got to be understanding, you know, I mean we gotta, you know, we gotta support the shit out of her. Background. According to an echolog found aboard Sanctuary 3, Flax served as an indexing unit under the command of a man known as the Grand Archivist. Sometime before the events of Borderlands 3, his employment was cut short when Flax suddenly acquired self awareness and a thirst for murder. At this time, it is unknown what brought about this sudden change in Flack or which archives Flack and his master were responsible for. After gaining self-awareness, Flack now roams from world to world seeking self-discovery, much like one of them 18-year-olds who just decides, yeah, fuck school, I'm gonna go travel around the world and not get railed by 14 men in a row. While he feels a connection to the primal wisdom of animals, the social constructs of humans are strange to him. Flack has an unending goal to change, the hunt, an apparent belief of hunting as a way of life. He pursues the hunt in an attempt to please Mistress Death, a personification of death itself. Involvement. Flack's involvement in the story is the exact same as Amara, as they have been involved with every mission together. He helps Lilith and the rest of Sanctuary find vaults all across the galaxy, opens them up and defeats Tyron and Troy at the end of the game, <coughs> destroy the handsome jackpot, have a wedding on a weird tentacle planet, cosplay as cowboys and foster the fantastic Cluck of Krieg. Until the foreseeable future, Flack is very happy with the position he holds within the Crimson Raiders, and much like Amara, decides to stick around for as long as needed. Skills. Right, so once again, there is a lot going on in the skills department in this game, so just bear with me and listen up. Flak's action skills are Fade Away, Rack Attack, Gamma Burst, and Gravity Snare. I'm just going to explain all of them just to make sure I've covered it. Fade Away. Flak cloaks, turning invisible, and can fire three shots while cloaked. Each shot is registered as a critical hit. While cloaked, Flak gains increased movement speed and health regeneration. This is a skill which is heavily inspired from Zero from Borderlands 2, and is basically the same, but he can shoot a few times without breaking cover. Rack attack. Flack sends forwards two rack to dive bomb enemies. Simple as that. Gamma burst. Flack creates a rift at a target location, teleporting a pet through the rift and doing radiation damage to nearby enemies. Additionally, Flack's pet becomes irradiated, growing in size and dealing bonus radiation damage when it attacks. Using Gamma Burst while Flack's pet is downed or dead will revive the pet at the targeted location with 30% of its health, but will double Gamma Burst's cooldown time. And finally, Gravity Snare. Flack tosses out a snare that knocks up and temporarily stuns nearby enemies. After being deployed, the snare periodically continues to knock up and stun enemies for the duration. While standing near the snare, pressing E will pick up the snare, ending the action skill early and refunding portion of the remaining duration. In addition to all that mess, Flack has a variety of pets that can be used in various ways and will always follow you around, making for a good cure to solo gamer loneliness syndrome. Once summoned, pets will automatically fight any enemies they encounter. This will continue until after the death of said pet. In this case, a cooldown period will begin, at end of which the selected pet will respawn automatically to join Flack once again. Each pet is tied to one of Flack's skill trees, and as skill points are put into these trees, new evolutionary forms will be unlocked for the associated pets, changing their stats, appearance, and the effect of Flack's attack command. 
The pets will also give ammunition, and on rare occasions, weapons, and will sniff out chests, prompting Flak to give the player a verbal command. In addition, Flak can gain the ability to turn enemies into pets, temporarily using the dominance skill of the master skill tree. If this ability is used on a beast, the duration of the effect will be doubled. The pets are as follows. Jabba Sidekick. Flak is joined by a Jabba Sidekick that is armed with a pistol. <laughs> Bro got the gap. While accompanied by the Jabba, Flak's movement speed is increased. Holding the action key issues an attack command where the Jabba throws a radiation barrel at enemies. Oh shit. Spider Ant Centurion. Flak is joined by a Spider Ant Centurion companion that imparts Flak with health regeneration. The Spider Ant will occasionally produce ammo and Flak will say things like, When did you eat that? And where were you keeping that? Holding the action skill issues an attack command where the Spider Ant charges into enemies. The Guard Skag. Flak is joined by a Guard Skag companion that increases Flak's damage while it's with them. Holding the action skill issues an attack command where the Skag vomits acid onto enemies. And finally, the Ion Loader. Flak is joined by a loyal mini Ion Loader bot companion armed with a shock snipe rifle. While the Ion Loader is selected, Flak gains increased resistance to all elemental damage. The Ion Loader will also create homing shock orbs that can be shot to trigger a shock nova. Kind of like DT. Issuing a command will cause the Ion Loader to attack the target with an eye laser. Can you now see how Borderlands 3 completely rips the other games apart in terms of depth and variety in the skills department now? My throat hurts. Strategy. Creating a build for this fucker is, at least in most instances, a more complex job than with most Borderlands 3's builds. Because it's not just you that you're upgrading, but also your pets. And these pets can grow to become extremely powerful by assigning your skill points into the right skill trees. Flak is definitely the solo man's player, mostly because of the pet, for more reasons than one. But the truth is that the sheer variation of skill tree types you can invest in makes for an extremely customizable build. Once again, the re Shield and the Pearl of Ineparable Knowledge are extremely useful, and depending on if you're more interested in making your pets more effective or yourself, it's good to get a respective class mod to match. It's fun time on the LFX Gaming channel now, featuring respected and all-round good noun facts. While Flak's pet cannot be disabled once one has been selected, resetting Flak's skill points at a quick change station will remove the pet. This allows Flak to play without their sidekick as long as one is not selected afterwards. Flak's name is shortened from a 512 alphanumeric character factory designator. During an interaction with Balex, Flak reveals, My 512 character alphanumeric designator has no meaning, but I have it shortened to Flak for the sake of time. I hope you like my Flak impression. <laughs> Early concept art depicts Flak as a cyborg instead of a robot. According to conversations in Guns, Love and Tentacles, Flak dislikes the texture of tapioca. And according to dialogue in The Bounty of Blood, Flak spends hours looking at cool frogs on the Echo Net. Finally, any skin and colour combination that is applied to Flak will also be applied to the pets. I love playing Flak, easily the most diverse character in Borderlands 3, and hell, maybe even the whole franchise. The amount of sheer choice you have when making a build reminds me of one of those Wednesday buffets downtown that offer like a hundred things, and whilst you know you definitely aren't trying everything on the menu, you'll give it a good fucking go. It also expands on the already explored idea of having a pet type skill, by adding more than just being able to upgrade one specific thing, but adding multiple things to mess around with. Until the hunting season begins again, I wish you luck in the wilderness, Flack. What is up, guys? It is Jay, morning after kill, and we're back here on some Broken Lands 3. Yeah, this next person is definitely broken. Someone who makes me want to revisit Titanfall 2 every so often, a girl who doesn't know the definition of reload, and someone who was revealed two years before the game came out, but they also kind of weren't at the same time because you can't see a face, and technically it was just a tech test, but it still made the whole community explode into pieces. And speaking of explosions, people kind of thought it was Tiny Tina. <gasps> it's Moe's. I'm Moe's. Here to kick ass and party, apparently in that order. Mozera Hayusinian Lan Mozera Hayusinian Lan Lun Al Mozera Hayusinian Lan Or just Moz is the playable gunner class in Borderlands 3. She, much like Axton, wears the trauma of war on her shoulder and has survived a suicide mission. She absolutely loves her mech suit, but not as much as she likes gatekeeping ammo. <laughs> Background. 
Mose was originally a soldier in the Vladov Army's Ursa Corps, a mechanised infantry division that utilised bipedal, 15 ton Iron Bear mechs. She became a battle hardened veteran of many ludicrous, dangerous battles across the six galaxies and rose to the rank of Gunner First Class. According to the terms of her enlistment contract, she was obliged to fulfil a quota of missions for Vladov before quitting. Moses' superior, Kaizak, manipulated her into staying on longer by constantly extending the quota and playing on her guilt with claims that her absence would jeopardise the lives of new recruits who depended on her experience, much to her chagrin and anger. Mose finally decided to quit after one final mission to Darzaran Bay, the rest of her squad perished, leading to Vladov assuming her dead as well. With the pain of losing her squad still fresh, she trusts only her mech, whose insides are dotted with photos and memorabilia from her past. After striking out on her own, the rising costs of maintaining Iron Bear eventually pushed Moj to travel to Pandora and seek the treasure as a Vault Hunter with the Crimson Raiders. Involvement Literally the same as the other two. Watch this. Help Lilith find vaults all across galaxy. Open them up. Kill bitchy echo streamers. Kaboom gambling. Hamelot get fingered by ring. I mean, get ring on finger. It's Ha Noon and Psycho Depression mission. Most happy with situation. Crimson Raiders sticks around. Boom. Summed up the whole game and its DLC in less than 20 seconds. Skills. Moses' action skill summons Iron Bear, her mech. It is capable of fighting without being piloted and comes with its own health pool consisting of armor. Iron Bear is capable of sprinting and jumping and can perform a double jump that allows it to hover and gain momentum. Continuous use of double jumping allows for movement speed that is faster than normal sprinting. Meleeing while in Iron Bear will cause it to do a powerful stomp that damages enemies around the mech. While in Iron Bear, Moe's cannot crouch, slide, grab ledges, slam, use emotes, or revive teammates. Iron Bear possesses a fuel bar that slowly drains while the mech is active and using its main weapon depletes fuel further. Other actions, including its melee stomp, will not consume fuel. Weapon fire rate also affects fuel consumption. If either the fuel bar or the health bar is depleted, the action skill will end. All of Moses' action skills are weapons that can be equipped on Iron Bear in various combinations, plus a tiny little minion. She has a total of seven action skills divided between four skill trees, with each tree having one action skill available initially, and one more than that can be unlocked. They are as follows. A rail gun that fires electrified higher velocity projectiles that deal shock damage after a short charging period. Bear fists, close range pneumatic driven fists that can deal massive damage. Minigun that fires rapid fire rounds and is capable of sustained fire. Firing the weapon for prolonged periods causes it to overheat and become inoperable for a short time. A salamander flamethrower that deals incendiary damage which can be fired as long as there's fuel, meaning you can cosplay being the Pacific in World War 2 as much as you like. A V-35 semi-automatic grenade launcher with projectiles that bounce and will detonate after a short delay or upon contact with a target. And no, you can't shove the fastball grenade mod on it, trust me, I've tried. A Vanquisher rocket pod that can fire rapid unguided missiles that are explosive. It automatically begins reloading whenever it is not being fired. That, and I'm convinced they made the rockets with depleted uranium. And finally, the Iron Cub. Iron Cub is a smaller, automated version of Iron Bear that uses less fuel and does less damage. Iron Cub equips two of whatever weapon is equipped in the remaining action skill slot. Whilst deployed, Iron Cub follows Moe's and will attack targets and enemies for the duration of the action skill. Strategy. Rocket pods. Well, what do you expect? Some sort of fucking elaborate guide on how to make a good build for Moe's? Level up. Invest in Demolition Woman. Equip rocket pods. Win. Rocket pods. You hear me? Pods. So apparently I have to actually tell you the best ways to build Moe's. It's a part of the legal binding contracts of section 859. Basically, I'll get sued into oblivion if I don't tell you what the fuck to do. So, yeah. Rocket pods thing was semi-ironic, but also kind of not semi-ironic at the same time, as it is legitimately the best strategy to use Moe's for. However, I get a lot of you don't just want to wait for your skill to reset, so you want to actually start firing guns at things. So I will cover my favourite build for Moe's, which is the Firehose Moe's build. Coined by Moxie, no, not that Moxie, the Firehose Moe's build is one of the most popular in the whole game. It focuses on high fire rate, explosions, and being allergic to the reload button. Trust me, if you use this build, your reload button will become dusty. Speaking from experience. Weapons like the Flipper and the Monarch are really good for this build, paired with, once again, the Revolter and Pearl of Ineffable Knowledge, and a Blast Master class mod. Investing all the way down the bottomless mags and Demolition Woman trees are your first priority. Going halfway down Shield of Retribution is also a super good choice, 
But you can invest some points in the other trees too if you really want to push the anti-reload propaganda. But now, nah, with all that being said, your best bet is still just to get rocket pods. Like, I'm not going to let it go. Fun Mose facts now. Simple as that. No BS. Let's get into it. Mose's code name was Iron Bear in her infantry division, the Ursa Corps. Ursa is Latin for bear. She is voiced by Cybergirl Zero, a known Japanese virtual YouTuber in the Japanese dub of Borderlands 3. Moses' character class, a gunner, is a successor to the soldier and commando classes from previous Borderlands games. Moes has the Vladoff logo tattooed on her hip. Her English voice actor, Marissa Lenti, had the tattoo recreated in the same spot to commemorate the role. She has an affinity for fried food and is apparently very open to trying delicacies so long as they are deep fried. And finally, in Guns, Love and Tentacles, Moes lets slip that she reads paranormal romance novels. Oh yeah, I got a good joke about Moe's as well. I made it up literally like 10 seconds ago, right? Why doesn't Moe's play Skyrim? Because she hates reloading saves. <laughs> I'm so bad at jokes. Moe's is easily grouped up with Salvador as the most broken as hell vault hunter in all of Borderlands' history. And ironically, they both involve a super short dual welding machine. She's definitely my favourite character in Borderlands 3, and whilst that will obviously show some natural bias, it's because of the fact that I absolutely love the concept of mech suits, Moses' semi-casual sarcastic humour, which is like my go-to, is so funny, and she was also the first class I picked when I started in the game. It's only after I unlocked pods I realised she was OP as shit though, so donate the player, hate the game. Wherever you and Iron Bear go in the future, I'll hope you'll find your way into the next Borderlands game. In a bit, Moes. Finally, the last character for literally every single playable character in Borderlands' history. We've made it. We've actually made it. We have a special little boy now. A whiskey drinking, rainbow chasing, why am I only using stereotypes of Irish people? He probably doesn't even do any of that. The brother of Captain and Baron, it's Zane Flint. I'm Zane. Zane Flint. Zane Danger Flint. Zane, ferocity, danger, flint, and so on. Zane is the playable operative class in Borderlands 3. He's part of the Flints, a very infamous family of bandits with a super weird way of pranking each other, but a real love nonetheless. Background. Brother of the bandits Baron Flint and Captain Flint, who began his life of violence as a teen, Zane left them to join a Black Ops mercenary unit and has since become one of the most capable operatives in the galaxy, doing odd jobs for the highest bidder. Having taken every kind of mercenary and assassination job there is, Zane found it increasingly difficult to enjoy a moment's peace due to so many people wanting him dead. He travelled to Pandora to lay low for a while, where he was recruited into the Crimson Raiders to assist in their battles against the Children of the Vault. I feel like the place where you're going to get the least likely chance to lay low is bloody Pandora of all places. God damn! Involvement. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it to be shorter again? Let's go. Lilith, Vaults, Galaxy, Open, Calypsos, Kill. Jackpot Boom, Hammerlock Wedded, Western, Krieg Mind, Happy with Crimson Raiders, Sticks Around. Now that's got to be a world record, right? Skills. Zane's unique ability mechanic allows him to use two active abilities at the same time, at the cost of forfeiting the use of grenades. While using a second ability resigns the grenade button to that skill, equip grenade mods will remain in their loadout slot. Additionally, each of Zane's active skills have a secondary function that can be activated while the skill is in use, with the exception of the Mantis Shoulder Cannon. Each ability slot also has its own dedicated modifier slot. Progressing through Zane's skill trees will unlock modifiers that enhance how their respective ability functions. These are their respective abilities. A Digi clone of Zane spawns in. The clone stays in place but distracts and fires at enemies. Pressing the assigned active skill button while the clone is active causes Zane and the clone to swap places. A sentinel drone that continually flies through the environment and attacks enemies with its machine guns. Pressing the assigned active skill button while sentinel is active causes it to attack the enemy under Zane's crosshairs, if any. A deployable barrier that blocks incoming projectiles and you can shoot through. Easy as pie. And finally, a shoulder mounted cannon. Pressing the assigned active skill button causes Zane to fire his cannon at his crosshairs and consume one charge. Strategy. You know, before I said that Flak was probably the most versatile of all the Vault Hunters, well, I think that Zane is pretty fucking close. Considering the ability to equip two action skills at once, the variation is through the roof and realistically trumps Flak, but shh, 
Psh, let's just talk about builds, okay? Another one by Moxie. I use this build simply because of the amazing name that was coined for it. Zane Zerka. Ain't that badass sounding? This build utilizes your Digi clone and focuses on you and the clone being able to dish out a substantial amount of damage each, relying on each other heavily. Also like Motus build, this one makes your reload button super dusty, so be prepared to shoot literally forever. You want to make your way all the way down to the bottom of the Hitman and Doubled Agents trees, and then splash the rest in the Professional tree. Weapons like the Free Radical, Soul Render, or the Sandhawk work really well and are some of my favourites to put on the clone. Pair this with Guess What Shield and Artifact and the Seeing Dead class mod, and you'll be drinking whiskey and chasing rainbows like there's no tomorrow. Seriously though, what is up with every build having the Pearl of Ineparable Knowledge and the Revolter Shield? It's like bloody Groundhog Day up in this bit. The last fun fact of the video, guys. I I'm, f I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling sad, guys. Are you? No? Well, you better be. Zane was leaked prior to the game's announcement in December 2018. Zane's tagline during the game's intro continues the trend of one playable character being introduced while breaking the fourth wall, with previous examples being Brick as himself, Zero as a number, and Claptrap as a mistake. Zane knew Zero from going to the same <laughs> assassin bars. He dislikes humorless people, suspects people not getting upfront things out of jobs, and hates the homogenous worship culture promoted by the Calypso twins because they want to round up everyone into an all-obeying cult. Finally! Finally! Someone who isn't complimenting their fucking coats! Zane has a bounty put on him by Cutlord Carew, Hyperion, Hepfires United, Malawan, Pangolin, and the Obsidian Block. That's a lot. Like... That's a, that's a lot. Zane's favorite ice cream flavor is cherry vanilla. And finally, according to several articles, Zane is very much a loner, despite being extroverted. Zane, Zane, Zane. The opposite to the rain, because when you go, there's nothing but pain. Like that little rhyme I did? No? Okay. Zane is a quirky little bastard, and I absolutely love his snide remarks, quick-witted humour, and fast-paced playstyle. The addition of being a flint is astounding to me. Never once did I think you'd be able to play as the brother of such iconic villains as Baron Flint and Captain Flint, so it's great that they included him in, lore-wise anyway. Sorry for killing your family though, mate. Hope you won't hate me forever, Zane. There are many characters we've been graced with seeing throughout the years each with a multitude of different motivations, backstories, charm, and abilities. From the elegancy of a siren who graces their power upon the world and has mysterious connections to the vaults, to depraved soldiers who are still looking for a place to stand and something to fight for. The assassins yearning for a target that fights back and the scarred innocents who've been brewed into evil. Oh yeah, and I'm Brick. The Vault Hunters that we play as each and every day are the reason we keep playing, the way that we can interact with the environments around us in the first place, and the people who we have the closest and most personal connection to out of any of the other characters in the whole franchise. The absolute passion and craftsmanship that has been dedicated to making, developing, and perfecting each and every one of these incredible badasses will continue to bring me back over and over, and I know the same can be said for you too. Whether you play as Lilith, Gage, Maya, Flack, Roland, Zero, Claptrap, Krieg, I know that we all have one thing in common. We love the Vault Hunters that we have had the pleasure of playing, and we wouldn't want them any other way. And that that's it. That, that is it, guys. Welcome to the end of the video. If you have made it to the end of this video, you are a real one. Three hours? Three hours. Yeah, not once did I suspect when I first started making this video that it would even be close to three hours long. When I did my last video and it was two hours, I was like, okay, this is probably the longest project I'm gonna ever do. Uh, little did I know that this project existed in the back of my mind. And then when I decided to do it, I thought, oh, yeah, maybe maybe like an hour and a bit, you know, maybe. Yeah. Not, not three hours long. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. And obviously, if you've got to this point, if you haven't subscribed already, please do. Obviously, it helps out. You know how YouTube works. People like subscribing. People like likes. People like watch time, all that bullshit. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Don't really know what else to say. You probably just want to go watch something else now, I suggest. So, very nice. I will see you guys in the next video. Enjoy the rest of your day. Peace.